Hello and welcome to the deepest dive for MinMax, the best, most thorough discussion about Mass Effect 1 on the internet. I am Ben Hansen, joined by Leo Vader. Thank you. Newcomer extraordinaire, and then we have Joe Juba. Hello! And Sarah Almolay, welcome back! Much obliged. Um, Sarah, welcome. Thank you for being here. I saw on Twitter, you had a tweet pinned that I feel like I felt bad for not giving you credit for it last time, but I just noticed it in this gap since the last episode where we covered the first third of Mass Effect 1. But mm -hmm. you directed the Batman trailer for Fortnite? I did! That's with Brian George, who's in this game that we talked about. He plays Samesh and other people. Oh, Samesh weird. Uh, what is it like yeah. to direct a, like, voice direct a Fortnite trailer? It's fun. I mean, it's like, it's <laughs> so much fun. Well, because it's like Fortnite, but it's also Batman. Right. So it's like bet, you know, and it's Alfred. So it's like these are known quantities and you're playing with them a little bit, but you're like, you know, keying into the spirit of who Alfred is and the relationship. And like and Eric Serpy, who wrote it, um, is a gem. And like, so he just really cares about the relationship between Batman and Alfred. So it was just it was playtime. It was fantastic. Oh, wait, Eric Serpy, he was at Telltale for a long time, right? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That's, he's the best. That's awesome. Yeah, um, let's see, Joe, what have you done with your life? Well, I've, I've been wondering in the last, you know, 20 seconds, whether or not there's ever, ever been a spot in Batman, like in the continuity of it. Has Alfred ever had to become Batman? Because that Ooh. seems like that seems like a softball that they must have hit by now. Right. Wow. I, I don't love that. Know. I mean, he definitely is like a fighter in a lot of the lore and continuity yeah. and stuff and has he's like his own sordid, violent past. But I don't know if he's like, yeah, I, I will be Batman. I don't know. I'm not I'm not in, to be clear. I'm not interested in actually knowing the answer. I just like thinking about <laughs> I, I just want to wonder about it. Whatever you do, I don't, don't want don't you to tell comment. me. I just want to enjoy my idea. <laughs> yeah, that's what I've been up to. So hey. there you go. <laughs> This mm -hmm. is the deepest dive on Mass Effect. The second discussion about Mass Effect 1. In the first discussion, we covered everything in the game up until you leave the Citadel. In this discussion, we're covering everything in the game from when you leave the Citadel to uh, tackling Artemis Tau, Novaria, Pharos, side quests, and everything up until Vermeer. We didn't go to Vermeer, and we're not spoiling anything in the game beyond that point or anything else in the trilogy, so it's a wonderful space for you if you have never finished this game or anything. We will not spoil it for you. And thanks everybody who submitted wonderful comments. How this works is we have people in the MinMax community play along with us. Uh, they support us at any tier. If you support us at any tier over at patreon.com slash MinMax with two ends, you can submit a comment for us to read. Also, if you head over to Patreon, you can unlock the podcast version of this discussion all of the other deepest dives we've ever done. We have a full backlog, all of our interview, uh, interviews, Max spoilers, early access to the MinMax Show podcast, a bunch of fun stuff. So if you enjoy this content, you can support it or you can join it over at patreon.com slash MinMax with two N's. Um, all right. We got a lot of comments, believe it or not, everybody, because we had a lot Ooh. to go through. I love the enthusiasm. People are very enthused. It's very fun. Okay. I would consider this the layup of the century, but... Every time for the deepest dive, we play most common comment. What do you think the most um, amount of people were leaving a comment about for the middle section of Mass Effect? Leo, you're thinking hard, so I'm expecting something good. If it's a layup, it's got to be something obvious. <laughs> that's right. The, that's the catch. Yeah. Yes. Hang on. Hang on. Hmm. It's the Mako, right? It's the Mako. About the Mako. <laughs> All right, and Leo, take your guess. Don't let these jackals influence you. <laughs> The Normandy. It was the Normandy. <laughs> People like the color scheme on the Normandy. They wouldn't stop screwing them. No, it was by far the Mako. Pro Mako, yeah. Con Mako, Side Mako, Thoughts on Mako. It was yeah. a Mako Palooza in that comment <laughs> section. <laughs> Mako me crazy. <laughs> Mako no. sounds like, ama like an amazing Mako monster truck rally. I'm just like all the mo worst driving and like. <laughs> just... Oh, that's basically what everybody's playthrough was. Yeah, for this yeah. section was their own one man monster truck rally where <laughs> <laughs> just somehow you lose every single round. I don't know yeah. how it works. Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, okay, we had two weeks to go through this section. Leo, I know you had a vacation in here. Were you scrambling like mad to get through this, or how was your play session? I mean, I didn't have time to do a ton of side stuff, but I wasn't pushing too hard. Like, it felt reasonably paced. I was surprised how fast each of the main planets went, really. Yeah. I feel like, um, I forget where it was. Maybe it was on the MinMax Show podcast, or maybe it was in a comment, but somewhere along the lines, some comparison was made for 
us on the last episode of The Deepest Dive talking to you about Mass Effect, it felt like we were all your parents trying to get you to watch uh, Star Wars Episode Four for the first time. <laughs> Isn't it great, five-year-old? Aren't lightsabers cool? And they're like, yeah, I don't know, I guess. <laughs> Um, so I look forward to hearing your thoughts this time around. I, I mean, oh, are, I, I want to I want to butt in and say, like, Leo, if something isn't cool or if yeah, you don't is. like something, <laughs> shut up. Right. Oh. I think, yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> like, really, like, I'm I'm interested in that. I don't, I don't yeah, want you to feel like you have to say things are cool because we clearly like them, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I just want to be careful about what I criticize be, by nature of it, like being a game that came out when it did. You know, it's hard not to look at it through that lens. Like playing it for the first time now, it feels like a new game to me. And for that reason, some things are falling short just by today's standards. But I don't want to just. It's boring to just dwell on that. Yeah, but I also think that that's interesting stuff to talk about because there are a lot of people like you who are coming at it from that that place of unfamiliarity and i think treating it like a new game in that sense and criticizing the things that it does even if you know they didn't know better in 2007 or whatever i still think that those are like you know i still think those are like valid things to talk about and fun things to dig into so okay, okay. i so feel like fun. we do that with literature all the time like we're always reading or movies like we go back and practice that lens a lot but like with games how often do i feel like the history just we just move on to the next hot thing and so we don't pre use that muscle a lot to like discuss like oh like where have we come from what changed what are we now tolerant of like i don't know totally yeah even just like waypoint design seems like a huge one especially in this chapter mm -hmm. i've had so many instances of the, on the map it says destination with a big flag on it and i'll like go to it and it's like i'm just in the middle of a cafeteria in Novaria. That's like what your is... own waypoint <laughs> you put on by accident we <laughs> <laughs> have the same revelation wait is that really what it is yes yes <laughs> oh but you can set this part yeah. out yeah, of the deepest you a or whatever you're using <laughs> are you serious i feel like such an idiot i ran to that spot and i was like okay game you're so stupid and it turns out i should have had a mirror instead of a tv leo <laughs> Well, if we Especially both did it, maybe it is a game that's stupid. <laughs> you never know. Oh, my God. Uh, but yeah, where's your trajectory at, Leo? Hotter or cooler on it for this section than last time? Uh, I think it's I think I would say a little cooler. I liked the main story stuff more than I liked the side stuff, for sure. The side stuff was remarkably samey, at least what I did, like going to a very open planet that's like a prettier dirt texture than 2007, but still just a big wide dirt texture. And then you go to a big building that is clearly the same inside, but with different boxes around. Yes. <laughs> that didn't make you know, me excited yeah. to continue the side stuff. I can't argue with that. Yeah, that's a totally like that's a totally valid complaint. And what I love is that when I forget where I read this, but like when Bioware was sort of asked about that, about those like repeated environments and stuff, they actually have an in-universe explanation for it. And even though that that doesn't make it like that, that doesn't make it more entertaining as a player. The yeah. fact that the idea is that like space colonization is still sort of a new thing. Oh, so these okay. buildings that they're putting down are like prefabricated they're prefab. structures. Yeah I, yeah, I get that. Yeah. <sighs> That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Uh, Sarah, where were yeah. you at trajectory wise for replaying this game from first section? Mm. Yeah, that I mean, but I what's interesting actually thinking about it is I think I probably had the same gripe. Like I had the mm. same gripe then and then I do now. Yeah. Like it's, you know, I mean, I don't I'm not mad about it, but like it's a slog and there's some important side quests. There's one in particular that I'm thinking of that's like really important and it's like accidental. It's just if you go there and then you got to clear a bunch of stuff and it's the most boring and you're and you're just makoing and it's it's really tough. And then, of course, it plays a huge role and you're like, well, I'm glad I did it. But woo. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like I want hmm. someone to tell me what the really important ones are like I, or the really cool ones, like the notable ones, because it's there's so much to choose from. It feels really like finding a needle in a haystack for the cool ones. Do yeah. you genuinely yeah. want to tip or no? I do. I would. I will write it down. I would find yourself wandering into the Armstrong Nebula. Okay. Armstrong, can you? Make a, I mean, make we can talk trip. about it if if you're not spoiling anything coming up. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. I mean, that's that's I, the get, that's Geth incursions, right? It is. Yeah. And it is, and you will find Tali to be very grateful to you mm. for having done that. Interesting. I like so, incursions. <laughs> yeah, so there's there's that one, which is I think is probably the most involved, or at least the most time intensive of those sort of like side questy things. Mm. And then, I mean, it's probably obvious, but like this is before uh, Mass Effect Two introduced 
something like a, a formally structured loyalty missions, but you still have something right. si similar to that where yeah. the one Sarah's talking about is essentially Tali's. And then you have uh, Rex and Garrus each have one for you yeah. too. If you talk to them enough, Rex is like something about his family armor and Garrus is like tracking down some Dr. Salion organ, guy. Yeah. An organ, a creepy organ. And yeah. then he's like selling them on a black market. The one really important one that the game does not put in front of you hard enough is called Rogue VI. I feel like, yeah, Dr. The, Admiral Hackett, he definitely tries to push you in that direction before you go to Novaria, or I don't know at what point, maybe it's just like the third mission. He tries to nudge you that way. It, it's, a, it's a level threshold, I think. Like once you mm, hit level oh. 10 or, or something, then it opens up. But I mean, how different is that from any other mission that you get? You know, it's like, yeah. like he's like, Shepard. We need you also Lance. Lance. I, yeah, that's so good. <laughs> oh, and you don't beating heart you, you still. Uh, anyway, but he's like, yeah, Shepard, you need to go to the. Uh, uh, we've got this rogue VI, but that sounds just like Shepard. We've got rogue smugglers in this system that you you know. So it's like call IT, restart it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> if you if if you don't just do it right away, it just becomes another quest in your log that you don't realize is important, but it's it's very important. Uh, can you I talk about it? It was important. It's yeah. in my list still. Can you I talk about why it's important, that. Joe, uh, without spoiling anything? Or just you want to talk about that oh, mission yeah, itself? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's totally it. within our section. So yeah. rogue, oh. the, the Rogue VI, which sends you to the to our Luna, like mm. our Earth's moon, has you doing a totally just like run-of-the-mill, normal, like, hey, I have to go enter some bases and shoot some stuff kind of thing. And at the end of it, you get your specialization class. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so, hey. all right. Now I'm confused because... I thought that the mission was on the moon, so I went to the moon and drove around a little bit, and it looks great, and then, like, went into a building and was like, I don't know how I interact with these six things or whatever this is going on in here, and then I just left. What am I missing? You shoot them. You go in there, and you you, you go in, and there should be some... I think there are enemies around when you first enter the building. Yeah, there are, and yeah. The, yeah, and then when you get... When you get to the next phase of the building, there are these rooms that have these like power gen or like VI construct gen. You just shoot them. You blow them up in, in three buildings. And uh, yeah, I guess maybe the game doesn't explain that super well either. No. But when it's done, so you know how like, for instance, if if you're like, I'm an adept, right? So I, I can put skill points in adept and like get better at that, but there's a ceiling to it at some point. When you get your specialization class, it basically gives you more, more points that you can. Uh, I think that's what it is. It gives you more points you can put something into. Okay. Or maybe it's just. So what's your uh, specialization? So I went to Bastion, which is. A, I can go on and on about how my class is the correct class to play. <laughs> Here, uh, we Effect, Here we go. Here we go. Regular classist. Well, no, because I classist. think that I think that uh, like Mass Effect as a shooter is fine. But I, I don't think that's where its real strength is. Like I, I oh, yeah. and what I love about being an adept is that the powers that you can use at least sort of add a different flavor to it. It makes it feel less like a normal, you know, like pop and shoot kind of game. And if you're throwing singularity at someone, which Liara has this power too, maybe if you, yeah, you've probably does. seen it, which is just awesome. It just sends sends you just like floating in the air, but also physics objects in the area, like you know, lamp posts and crates and stuff like that. So it's just this sort of like agent of chaos there in the field. But then you can also do fun stuff like crowd control where uh, adepts have a power called stasis that I guess other squad mates do too, that normally just freezes someone in one spot and they can't take damage. So normally that's handy if like, let's say there's a big like Krogan battle master running at you. You can sort of put him on hold while you take care of whatever situation is going on. But if you're a bastion, you can damage people in stasis. Oh, so that means, snacks. So that means that there are like bosses that I go up against <laughs> that you can just throw in stasis and then just stand there like idiots and you just go point blank with your assault <laughs> rifle and they can't do anything. Boy, I'm That's glad funny. I went to the moon. This is pretty sweet. <laughs> That's absurd. That, I didn't know that. I don't think I knew that. That's I dope. definitely need to. Yeah. I, I think my save is on the moon right now, but I swear I tried shooting those things yeah. and it didn't do anything. But hey, Lev submitted a comment here saying the one uh, side quest I will remember the most was going to the local cluster, which turned out to be our solar system. System. Getting to explore the moon and seeing the Earth just above me as I drove around made me audibly gasp. It is so good. Uh, 
just like that. Patrick Henderson wrote in saying, on the moon, you can find the CCCP Luna 23 lander based off the real lander, which was sent to the moon in 1974 and tipped over after landing. <laughs> I love that it's, eh, it just tipped over and we can't do anything about it. It sucks. <laughs> but yeah, clearly Bioware, huge fans of uh, space travel and real space history. I mean, Shepard obviously named after Alan Shepard and all that stuff. And Without spoilers, Mass Effect 3 has the most ham-fisted homage to NASA I've ever seen in my life. Some would I don't say, remember. "Oh my God, Sarah!" I'm gonna have to explain. You I don't of all people, I played it the least. I mean, okay, light, light, vague spoilers for a thing at the you end of Mass Effect. No, no, don't, no. don't do it, don't do it. <sighs> don't just tune out for the next ten seconds, Sarah. They have a voice actor from. <laughs> Apollo 11 <laughs> at the end of Mass Effect no. 3. Do you not remember this performance? It I is don't remember. Unbelievable. <laughs> don't remember. Please, as an expert in voice direction, listen to that yeah, and try not to shove something aggressive into your ear. Anyways, hey, look at this, everybody. We got a lot of great comments from people. Um, let's start with the gameplay. Joe, you kind of, you cracked that seal. Um... Here's a nice basic one. John Skavik submits a comment over on Patreon saying, Hey, y'all, how do you decide which party members to bring on any given mission? Your two favorites the whole way through. Whoever fits best for that mission story-wise, whoever can unlock things the best. What, what's your strategy for choosing who's going on these missions? I'm really curious about Leo's answer to that one. Yeah. I just go with who I like want to get to know better at this That's point. Sweet. Yeah. Which who's has that? been... Like mixing between Rex and Garrus and Tally and the Asari character, Liara, and not the humans, pretty much. <laughs> but it's like <laughs> I've been liking Rex just for yeah. his just for his voice. It's just always a welcome input in a conversation. There was a part at the end of uh Neveria where I decided to let the aliens race live. And they said, uh, the lead alien said, we'll write songs about you. And where is the quote that Rex said? He said, great, bugs are writing songs about you. <laughs> <laughs> that was really good. That's perfect. So do you feel like you're focused now? Do you feel like you've learned enough and dabbled enough with the characters where you're like, all right, from here on out, I'm, I'm sticking with these two buddies? I don't know. I think I'm going to keep mixing it up. I don't feel like I've been left behind by like bringing somebody who i haven't leveled up yet i don't feel like it's made a super big difference in the combat yeah i'm with you i was sticking with kind of my original crew which was garris and liara and i think in this stretch in particular liara is really interesting to have for so many of these plot points and stuff especially novaria um but then i was like you know i like garris he was he was my boy last time around but like i think it's time to see somebody new and so I, I tried to do the underdog move, and so I've been rolling with Ashley and Liara. Um, and believe it or not, Ashley wants you to kill that freaking Ragnash. Uh, <laughs> Step on his head, end him! Like, he won't have it. Um, but it's, shock of shocks. Right, right. It's been interesting to, to see that. Actually, we have somebody who wrote in about that idea. Clement Zobel wrote in here uh, saying, Your squad mates exist on a Paragon Renegade scale which affects their dialogue during Paragon Renegade choices. The squad mate with the higher Paragon score will advocate for the Paragon choice and vice versa, the more Renegade mate. Uh, from most Paragon to most Renegade, I believe the scale is Caden, Liara, Tally, Garrus, Ashley, Rex. Wait, and, say that one more time slowly. So Caden's the most Paragon, and then descending uh -huh. order, it's Liara, Tally, Garrus, Ashley, Rex. So well, that one. means if you have okay. Ashley and Rex in your squad, yes. like for the Rachni moment, even though they're both sort of on the renegade end of the spectrum. One of like Ashley will promote letting will them she? survive. Yeah. And Rex will promote letting them. She die. will. Yep. So that's oh. what uh, Clemens oh. explains here. So yeah, Caden, Ashley and Garrus can move around on a scale depending on dialogue choices. I had a playthrough where Liara was more Paragon than Caden because Caden ninja romanced me and was jealous. And I was romancing Liara. I set things straight and I guess that bumped him back up because later Liara had some pretty ruthless things to say on a quest decision. I've even heard tale of making Ashley slash Caden more renegade than Rex. Can you imagine Rex dialogue advocating for Paragon choices? It's a fun idea of like wow, really pushing that? people outside of their boundaries, but mainly by being a, an F boy. <laughs> I guess so. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Um, well, 
I, I want to quick touch on something there that uh, talked about st- being stealth romanced by Caden. Mm. I yeah. have been, uh, well, I guess with, without talking about anything coming up in the next episode, uh, I, I have not been very enthusiastic about Ashley, obviously. And give her a chance. I've man. been trying, I, I've been trying to bring Caden along more often on missions and stuff, but at the same time, I'm also super paranoid about, missing like those like things like loyalty missions and you know like gear and stuff like that so when ashley says like when basically when ashley starts coming on to me i never i've never flirted back with her in any sort of like obvious way i've always but i've just been not overtly mean like i haven't directly (laughs) shut her down right kind of gotta don't you and now she's like super into me and I all I, I don't have mean options any. I mean, that's like <laughs> it's, this must be what a woman feels like on the Internet, where if you're just like unless you just are totally mean. Right. People will. Uh, will Good morning get an, to you. Yes. Yeah, so well. Yeah. So you're saying I have a chance. OK, cool. Yeah. I, yeah. So, oh yeah. God. I mean, <laughs> so yeah, Ash, Ashley is totally like you're saying I have a chance when I have given her no indication about this. I, we so, should, can we should we talk about the way the pacing of the romances? Can we can we do that? I would love if you talked about that. Absolutely. Uh, I feel like we we touched on this a little bit with the vision or just other. It feels like I feel like I'm missing beats here. Yes. Like I'm not privy to beats that Shepard is having, and that when you combine that with a dating mechanic, it gets real weird. And so everyone like Liara comes on to you immediately, right? And, and kind of Caden, like I mean, like and then she's like, I find you fascinating. I'm like we just ta- I just. We were just in the briefing room. Like, you just got on board. What, the, what are you talking about? And so, like, there maybe is this implication in the writing that, like, we've had nice banter at the, the cafeteria. We've stared at the start. Like, what am I not getting that we that you are interested in me based on just, like, you know, brushing dirt off from Therum? Like, what are you talking about? And it's, it's um, bizarre when it's, it's like weird. Mass Effect is held up as, you know, a pinnacle. A lot of Bioware stuff in this era as, like, pinnacle relationships, romances, and games. And it's like... Realistically, you talk to a character twice and they're like, hey, you want to go bang? Like there's right. literally there's literally like a, a dialogue option here talking to Liara where it just said, I am attracted to you. And it was. Yeah, you're totally right. After like two conversations, it's like, OK, sure. She's like, I'm feeling there's like there's some attraction between us. And I'm like, based on what? Yeah. what are you talking about? You can like do a hey, welcome aboard. Let's drop the formalities. <laughs> you and me. <laughs> the pants. I feel like there's a lot between us. <laughs> I don't know what you mean. It's so I've, I've I feel like, I mean, I do still believe that Mass Effect is, as a series, has, like, wonderful romance. And a lot yes. of that is to do with history. I mean, like, the, the really juicy, to my mind, the really juicy, I mean, I, I, everyone knows I'm into Garrus. I don't know if you can see it in the crop. I have a Garrus portrait right here. I cropped it out specifically. Me. Um, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, so the, um, I just think that it's, and so the macro view is that you have all this history, and especially with something like Garrus, you can't romance in the first one. Like, that has a really nice build. Um, but these, this first one, this first game, it's just so hot and heavy so quickly. And it, and it just, I wonder if it's just an editing technique that just lands weird. Cause you're like, I need to make decisions about this. And I'm lacking information about the decisions that I'm making right now based on not having actually hung out with this person. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it yeah. made more sense with the longer loading screens. You can assume more <laughs> stuff. The elevators, there were extended <laughs> elevator conversations where they like right. got really close and it was really hot. And yeah, that is true. In every TV show and movie I've seen where people have been trapped in elevators for right. long periods, they do come out of it closer together. That's, That's right. True. Yeah. Uh, no, yeah, I think there's. There, I think there's really something to that though. Where you know what it reminded me of, and this is maybe a bit of a tangent. I'll try and keep it short. But like, it reminded me of when I was a kid. I used to watch that. Uh, that first Batman movie, the Michael Keaton Batman movie over and over and over again to the point that it's almost like, it almost like became a loop to me where you like, as a kid, I understood the relationship between like Batman and the Joker and, and, and Bruce Wayne and Vicki Vale. Like it's like, it always existed. When, mm-hmm. So when I, so like when I start, when I start a new watch through of that movie, yes. I'm bringing with it everything from my previous like watch through. So all of that context is sort of built was built into it already. But when I rewatched Batman, you know, like a decade later, I was like, Whoa, this sucks. At least this, like re- this, this relationship building, this, th- mm-hmm. that stuff. So I'm feeling Batman returns. However, <laughs> that oh, makes way more very sense. Thoughtful. Anyway, sorry. Uh, but, so anyway, that that's what it reminded me of because as I'm going back to mass effect here, 
I feel like it's the it's the same thing where my memories yes. of how I interacted with Garrus and Liara, Liara and all those folks is sort of colored by all of my eventual interactions with them and not really isolated to this one game. And in this one game, it is really apparent to me how uh, how early Bioware is in figuring out yeah. how to establish party dynamics and relationships that they I think they definitely figure out later. Yeah, I agree. But this is still in a in a very like transactional phase of like romance and relationships with characters and and that comes mm-hmm. through. I mean this is even this came out before Dragon Age even came out and Dragon Age Origins was like their romance system was just you give presents to someone constantly until they like you yeah. and then they'll sleep with you, you know? And so it's like, right, yeah, that was the evolution. And then, and then by inquisition, we're not even for, I mean, I think there might, there may be exceptions, but like many of the sort of like money shot, like scenes of, of just like, <laughs> yes, we did it. You know, thing aren't of sex anymore. It's like pre or post. And it's like just a really nice beat. That's actually interesting to watch and not just smushy char- game characters. Blech. Yeah. Um, and, and so yeah, it, and it like, lets you, it lets you have that with characters who aren't your romantic interests also. It lets you uh-huh. just pursue, pursue that in, in other ways too. So yeah, yeah, I think, I think that uh, it is just, it, it's, it's weird because it feels like a Bioware game, a modern one in so many ways. Mm-hmm. And yet that specific element, like it feels really weird to only have banter between characters when they're in the elevator. Mm-hmm. And it's right. like when you're walking around this weird moon, they very rarely like chime in or talk to each other. And it's like, I feel like I've been taught by now that like, that's just, that's what, that's what characters do in these situations. That's oh, how yeah. I get to know them. Yeah. Elena P oh, writes in about that saying, I've always loved the Mako. Yeah, I know. But this time I noticed something that never bothered me before. The lack of banter between squad mates while you're driving. Mm-hmm. It's such a missed opportunity for more character development and funny one liners. They wrote all those elevator convos. Why not do something like that for the Mako? I guess this is mm-hmm. the one thing Andromeda did better. Cause yeah, that's true. In the, in the Nomad and Andromeda, they would actually talk to yeah. each other. And I'm sure it's just, you know, this script was a bit big and the production was yeah. a bit troubled, you know, so it's amazing they got it out the door when they did. But now looking back mm-hmm. on it, it is just eerily silent during these long stretches where it's like, come on, start flirting in the car, please yeah. do anything. Right. right. And then, and they're not flirting with each other yet, you know, which they will do. Right. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, Melissa Louise wrote in about the exact idea about just all the romances feeling really weird and rushed in retrospect and mm. Caden, you know, told me I'm giving him mixed signals when I was just trying to have a conversation. And, uh, David, I asked how you word, bro. What? <laughs> David Dillinger writes in uh, and he says, first time playing and I was surprised to get romance dialogue from Liara right after her mother's death. <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. like, I don't wow. know. You, know. <laughs> you win some, you lose some. One of you know, <laughs> grief hits everyone real different. Right. I'm, right. I'm not judging. In High Fidelity, there's that sex scene at the funeral. That's, you know, it's, Possible in other films. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Makes you think about being alive. (laughs) There we go. John Ford uh, himself actually uh, submitted a comment over on Patreon. Bringing up the old chestnut here saying, Shepard has a problem with pursuing sexual relationships with their employees or crew. Yeah. I mean, how exactly does one break up with an all-powerful beloved specter like Shepard? Power fantasies and relationship sims don't mesh well. Which... I would be very curious to see how Bioware would handle this moving into the future. If it is like, yeah, has society just changed to the point that now the idea of the specter being like, you, me, let's go in the back of the Normandy. It's like, I don't know if this is as hot anymore as it is just bizarre. Inappropriate. Inappropriate. (laughs) Yes. Round of Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's great by me. Right. Like, go ahead. Oh, uh, that comes up with, when you talk to Ashley about some of this stuff, where it's like, like she, like, when she first starts coming on to you, you have an option to just be like, that's inappropriate, shut it down, which closes off this whole conversation. So I didn't do that. But part of that discussion is Shepard saying, like, I can't fraternize with, you know, the officers on my ship. Yeah, because she talks, she has a mail, as they put it, um, from her sister. And it's her sister talking about how cute yeah. Caden is. And then Ashley t- comments on that and be like, well, I know fraternizing is against regulation. You know, don't ask, don't tell. Like she explicitly says, that's how it works in space now for just yeah. sleeping when, on a ship. When you're male shepherd, it's about you and not Caden. Right. Right. I'm sure. Oh, OK. Oh, yeah, interesting. That sense. That's a fun little yeah. distinction. Yeah. So you are you are canonically hotter. 
Yeah, we, we all That's understand cool. that fully. <laughs> Take that, Caden. Uh, let's see, Jordan Homdale uh, writes in and says, I'm playing as Femship. Uh, Fem Shep, and in the scene where Liara shares her romantic feelings uh, with Shepard, there was a dialogue option on the left side of the wheel that read, You're female! Uh, as a bisexual person in 2021, I did not care for the heavily implied bi homophobia and the phrasing of the prompt. Although I later watched that scene on YouTube, and fortunately, the actual line from Shepard is confusion about how Asari chooses partners rather than just bigotry. Uh, right. Though this prompt still came as to me as a relic of a different time and another reminder that Mass Effect is a much more heteronormative than I ever called type of game. Overall, I'm still having a great time with the deepest dive. Um, yeah, I saw that, and I think that... There's definitely, we talked about it last time, a lot of those situations where the little summary prompt doesn't quite match the tone. And I'm glad that the Jordan here actually dug around to see that, okay, in context, it's not as brutal, but if we have to sum things up in 20 or 2007, yeah, let's just make it that. Like, what? But you're it's a lady right. It's alien. like they needed Shepard to be shocked by the alien way of seeing things. And so that's why you have your female if you're a femme, if you're a female Shepard, or you're an alien if you're a, a bro Shepard, and you're like, Okay. Yeah. I don't know why so, these are interchangeable to you, but fine. <laughs> Fungible objections, I guess. Um, so weird. Um, yeah, but I guess they're just like, if that's the beat you need, like, oh, they do things differently. Look, space is wild and full of people who do stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm like, yeah, there's better ways to do it. I don't know. Sh Shepard either needs to be, depending on whether they're male or female, needs to either be space racist Right. Or a homophobe. Or just or a that particular flat out homophobe. <laughs> right. In a way that makes no sense because, again, aliens and gender were off the map. Well, like, what are you talking about? Yeah. Like, right. You know. But you got to remember this era. I mean, I don't know if you all recall the big sex box I headline do. on Fox News where Leo, I don't know if you recall this. Um, I remember it well. Okay. Yeah. Where's was like the whole Fox <laughs> News segment about this game is all about banging aliens, you know, and customize your partner. <laughs> is that what it said? For, yes. <laughs> Just customize who you have sex with this whole game. I would, yeah. And, 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 Tinder 50 million years later. Like, <laughs> I went back and watched some of that other. debate because Jeff Keighley then went on uh, and tried to debate somebody at Fox about why you're know, trying to put it in context. And he did an admirable job of just like, this is 20 seconds of like a 30 hour game. That's incredible. Like, don't try and boil this down to this is the game where you have sex on your Xbox. Cause if people in your audience want that and they go out and buy this game, they're going to be woefully disappointed by the experience yeah, here. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of make O to slog through. Yeah. The, I mean, was the objection the alien part or the female part? I think it was just sex in general. I'm trying to remember. Video I think video games are for kids. So sex oh, in it okay. is. Okay. Well, then they missed Jade Umpire. <laughs> Nerds. <laughs> yeah. Believe it or not, it was not exactly in their wheelhouse. Yeah. Um, let's see, Meet Tornado, uh, just on this uh, train of thought, says, I just want you to know that because of the deepest dive, I can't look at Garrus anymore without thinking of the phrase cricket dick. Um, I apologize, Meet Tornado, that is that is Jeff Cork's phrase, but it is, he has a way with words. Why did we bring it back? I'd forgotten about it. <laughs> sorry, sorry to really drill it into your head even more. Um, let's see, so many areas we could go to. Should we start working through this thing? Oh, we didn't even get back to the point about which characters you're bringing. Sarah, who are you bringing on these oh. missions? Switching it up. I'm keeping it loose. Yeah. Is it yeah. going to stand I mean, out? I mean, I like thought I was going to be Garrison Rex the whole way through. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, being a Sentinel means that I, I, ha I can get good coverage. For a second there, I was genuinely locked in because I forgot about, <laughs> I just forgot about the need to have both electronics and decryption leveled up so I have access to all the things, all the boxes mm, yeah. in the world. Um, so for a minute, I was kind of bound because I, I like, I only had electronics up to a certain things, so I was stuck with crew members who had decryption up to a certain thing, and then eventually I got them both on, you know, up on my end, um, up to speed, so I could take everyone, anyone I want. Um, and now I'm just kind of bopping it around, yeah. including Ashley. I took Ashley on the Tali thing. I thought, well, oh, sister trip. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> like, yeah, see, she's not so bad. See, right? She's Kimberly is really, and I hate. I mean, here's me con irresponsibly conflating the actor with the character again. But like, she's <laughs> yeah. good. And when you talk to her about anything else, I think she's really natural. She's really like, she's got a subtle charm to her. Like, you know. So yeah. So she was fine on that trip. I didn't take her in front of the rack when I came in, where she was like, <laughs> um, so she mostly behaved. I didn't take. I took her away from urban centers and interacting with other people. <laughs> I took her out uh, to the plane. <laughs> you know. Hide her a little bit. Yeah. Right. Uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> Stephen Mintz uh, submits a comment over on Patreon saying, Ashley Williams quoting Alfred Tennyson's, t- yeah. Tenny- Tennyson's? Ulysses Tennyson. has always been the standout character moment of Mass Effect 1 for me. It doesn't excuse her prejudice, but it does exemplify Bioware's attempts to give these characters some genuine emotional complexity. Um, I did like that read. moment, she yeah, where she, good. yeah, where she starts quoting this poem, and then one of your options as Shepard is just, "What's this crap?" <laughs> Which is a very <laughs> good problem. <laughs> Joe, did you do that one, or I guess you didn't want to get near Ashley? No, see, th- that's another case where it's like I did at first, and then it shuts down the conversation, and it's like I don't have to reload my save, and it got to the point where I like mm. save before I talk to any party member because I don't. I always want to do the renegade thing unless it like just shuts down a conversation avenue, you know? Right, so. right. Um, but yeah, it's interesting. I, I think Ashley talking about the fact that she still believes in God in this future, I think is like an interesting wrinkle. And there's a brief yeah. discussion about just her talking to Shepard, be like, that's okay that I believe in God, right? That I, you know, try to talk to my father after he passed and all this stuff. Um, but like her first big story beat is definitely, I've never felt more aligned with Shepard where she tells a story about her sister and it's like this long backstory about her sister and a yeah. boyfriend in high school that was a little bit pushy. And then like after she tells this whole story, after everybody else's story is just like incredible and full of good sci-fi and then hers is kind of just like this high school tale that isn't about her, it's about her sister. And then Shepard has a prompt response that you could just say, well, that was pointless. It's like, well, <laughs> I wasn't quite to that level, but it's like, okay. Yeah. You it's dark. It, it makes I me, liked that story. I, I, I feel like the biggest Ashley defender of this podcast. Now, even I was like, that's an interesting way to lead for the Ashley storyline and character stuff. But it, the point is that it's about her connection with her sisters and their connection with their mm-hmm. mom. And then as you continue to talk to her later, she unveils more about like her backstory and how you didn't uh, look into my files or anything, did you, Shepard? And it turns out that her grandfather was the first right. uh, human to surrender to aliens in battle, like in the first contact where immediately he's, he's like, all right, all right, I give up, I give up. He's just like, <laughs> no, they were getting pummeled. They were no, getting pummeled. No, don't try like, and defend this act. He's basically the galaxy's coward. He just immediately saw an alien. He's like, all right, all right, and set down his guns. And that's so that's not like, what I remember her saying. I remember her saying that people were dying and it was really hopeless and like he did the right thing and it, but well, it was a humiliation. You're right. That's her take on it. Everyone right. else sees him as like, yeah, like Mr. <laughs> He's just got a white flag on like a spring loaded white flag that just springs up. <laughs> bang, bang. Like yeah, we, should check, we should look into that. I would I want a canon confirmation on what actually happened at Shanxi. I'm going to find this out. Ooh, I that would be know. fun. Um, right. Yeah, so that's the idea. That's why she doesn't like aliens because her family yeah. has been shamed by aliens her entire life. And and she's been held back. I mean, well, you know, they can't really get so... They can only go so far in the military as a result. Yeah. I have that. And my, my, my dad's uncle was that way. He, he was prevented from because of racism and stuff. Like, being held back when that's when the militaries are calling, it's stinky. Right. No doubt it's stinky. Here's a delicate... Maybe this isn't delicate as a subject, but I've been thinking too much about it. Leo, help me help me navigate this. Is Ashley inherently racist because she doesn't like other species? Do you know what I mean? Like, what's the difference between her like really looking down on whales on Earth versus looking down on a Turian? Is the projection of like calling her racist from our perception of racist doesn't really work? Is she you getting a bad the rap? right person? Yeah. First off, thank you. <laughs> I <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's 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 a whale. You know, the whales and dolphins are smart, right? But it's yeah. not like they're a person but blue. So you it's know? just like there's a difference there. So even though technically in the world of Mass Effect they're another species, but if they're just humanoid, then it's racist to not like another humanoid. Pretty much, I think it falls in the same basket of like stereotyping. But does it only do that because we all? view sci-fi as like a lens to our own society and we're all trying to use I mean, everything as a they metaphor but this sci-fi as a lens to our society right like right. they're so interchangeable with humans yeah <laughs> Feedback loop. does anybody else have thoughts on this weird topic well i mean you're t- i think right it's degrees of sentience and sophistication and but it call it does call into question our own ability to perceive that intelligence and like whatever i mean yeah, there's probably an argument that says like we should not, we shouldn't bring that bring that attitude back to our own ecosystem and other you know animals that we coexist with. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think that the, the uh, certainly the fact that we go visit a hyper evolved space station full of people of various races 
more or less effectively coexisting should be a sign that maybe we should learn the manners of the place and, and, and give them a little credit, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's, there's also something to be said about like, it's, it's hard. It's hard to, I think, sympathize with Ashley's viewpoint on that because all of the alien races, whether or not they're humanoid are presented as like, like as intelligent or more intelligent than humans. Right. right? Mm -hmm. Like I think, I think it would be, uh, it would be more of a gray area or more difficult to talk about if, if there were races that were being like discriminated against for uh, like, like if, if they paint, if they painted the races and their, and their tendencies or the species and their tendencies with more nuance, rather than just like, these are all basically just humans in different shells, which really means that she is judging them solely on how they look and how they behave as a culture rather than anything about who they actually are. Right, mm -hmm. right. I mean, we'll get to some, I just realized I haven't seen a Vorcha yet, so they may not be introduced until two. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're not here till two, but there's... Yeah. We, don't, we don't even get to see Batarians until the, right. the DLC. Yeah. So. Oh, that was the DLC, that X-57 asteroid thing? Mm-hmm. Okay. Did you all do that? Do mm -hmm. okay. Um, I did. I don't think I played that in the first one. So it was a weird thing of like, oh, I thought Batarian just came in two, but it's yeah. wild that yeah, they actually have it here. And so it's just this, uh, maybe like an hour long little oh. story about an asteroid <laughs> plummeting towards Terra Nova, like this this planet. And you talk to somebody, and he's like, oh, that that asteroid, it's like a thousand times bigger than the one that took out the dinosaurs and it's going right towards this very nice town where my family lives. And it's just this funny little <laughs> beat where he goes, it's a very nice town. There are great schools. And I'm like, yeah, I, I'm going to try and make the asteroid avoid. Like, you telling me the schools are good isn't really affecting anything. Great school. I'm not buying property there, dude. I don't care. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> like the, I love the implied conversation there. It's like, they're going to destroy my planet. Shepard. But how good are the schools? <laughs> School district like. <laughs> Very good. Very good. High scores. AP classes. <laughs> All right. Uh, but yeah, I, I, it's an interesting beat talking to the Batarians because the entire thing is very you know, space racist where it's a lot of Shepard, even in like the Paragon moves, her just being like, oh, these Batarians, look out. They're, they're no good. Mm -hmm. They're bad news. And there's this big bad, Balak is his name, is a big bad Batarian. We should, save that. we should save this for the next episode. What? I, think that we I haven't done it yet. Yeah. yeah, we told folks that we'd do DLC in episode three. Oh, geez. I just thought it was a side quest. All right. No. I probably, yeah, bring, yeah that, that, I want to make sure I trigger it because I'm not sure that it came up for me, but I have to go check. Okay. It'll just be it'll just be on your map. Like, so where it says Novaria, okay. Pharos, the, one of the things says X57. Yes. Oh. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's, the, right. that, that's the bring down the sky DLC. Perfect. Yeah. Good call, Joe. Thanks for being an expert. Yeah. Uh, beating down Brian here. Big supporter of Patreon. Thank you. Uh, he says, so this is my first time playing, and I'm curious, this is basically at the tail end of the last section, start of this section. I'm curious if the big speech that you give before heading out of the Normandy was a standout point back in the day. Admittedly, it's a little bit cornball, but I'd also be lying if I say it didn't totally work on me. After the somewhat slow start of the Citadel, it made me feel like my adventure was truly starting in earnest. It rules. Yeah, it's great. Being able to like crap <laughs> is awesome. It's like a fun, such a fun thing to do with a classic sci-fi trope it made it felt totally fresh and cool for me yeah uh, uh yeah me too i loved it it's good ace here lord thor submits a comment over on patreon saying the first time you go to that world map and it takes four or five zoom outs to see the entire galaxy is Mwah. uh was a little annoyed though by how long the load times still are for traveling between systems but i think it's totally worth it for the sense of scale the game creates even though it's only a few seconds it sort of creates the feeling of going to another place like oh let me just scan those last couple planets while i'm in the system also, I've enjoyed reading through the descriptions of planets. Stuff like the capital of the moon being called Armstrong makes for an interesting little tidbit. Yeah. Uh, that is one part that I have fully skipped this time, is reading all of the descriptions of the planet. Yeah. So There's there no was... way to get it to play the audio while you're out of the menu, right? Up from the codex? I don't they, think those are voiced. No. Yeah. They're not voiced. Yeah. No, it's the, just it's just the description that comes up when you arrive at a planet. Oh right. There's that but I guess my there. question stands for the actual codex. No. Oh, you can't no. like trigger it and then go do other stuff while he continues to explain. Yeah, I right. can't. That would be cool. It should have been yeah. just like a radio station on the Mako. I think that would have been a cool little touch. Ah. Just every channel is just a different description explaining the world. Wikipedia. Yeah, Shepard's just walking around with his podcast or his podcast in hardcore history. <laughs> yeah. It was it was funny for me because I have been instantly skipped like 
I go to a planet and if it doesn't say survey or land, then I just instantly back out. I have not, I have read almost no descriptions, except there was one that I was just like, maybe I should read one of these. And it turns out to be like one of the most interesting and relevant <laughs> uh, planet descriptions in the whole game that you can read. What is it? Uh, so it's, well, the problem is, is I can't go too far into it without spoiling other stuff in uh, this game and the and the series. All right, never mind that. But what I'll say is, read the descriptions in the in the dis system. Dis system. Dis. Yeah. Okay. Mm. You got to check out dis system. Uh, Colton Westbrook uh, submits a comment <laughs> on Patreon saying, "I want to give a shout out to another place of excellent world crafting. The planetary descriptions. A lot of love for these, Joe. They contain so much information about the element composition or colonization or just the straight facts about orbiting cycles. Hell yeah, nerds, nerds, nerds. However, it also <laughs> includes random nugget, nuggets of lore, such as that the planet Trellin uh, has a Salarian religious cult that claims a certain pattern of overlapping craters in the southern hemisphere hemisphere resembles their goddess." And that's nice. just fun, says Colton. Yeah, it seems like they have one juicy little fun nerdy sci-fi thing in these descriptions. But Maniac86 writes in saying, I love when scanning seemingly random planets, there's a surprising amount of lore. One has a Bermuda Triangle-esque reputation with rumors of nanobot swarms destroying ships and probes that enter its atmosphere. Another, Clendagon, has a rift valley covering half a hemisphere, and scans indicate a glancing blow from a mass accelerator round... 37 million years prior when landing on the moon you can look up and see the gouge lore like that no game consequences lore like that no game consequences just add to how this universe is massive and ancient existing long before any of the serial races protheans or even reapers it's a, it's a great point for sure just to what I, what I will say about all the writing and like because <laughs> I think it's kind of cute that they didn't have any other way to get it into the game than just have the thought we wrote it but it's like there's so much energy and passion and exuberance in that like you can just feel the enthusiasm of this whole team for making it a really lived in place and like just the depth of attention that they've applied to all this stuff so it's like it's I even though I'm not reading it I'm like oh thank you yeah, <laughs> you, same. yeah. Oh. you can tell it was just super fun to write for them yeah, yeah I I feel like a total a hole for skipping over it the way I am because like like it's yeah. like a, as a writer right like I know <laughs> I know <laughs> that someone is putting a lot of effort into crafting those little stories and like as a consumer of this entertainment and, and like that is part of the experience that they are giving people and yet I as someone who enjoy, like I love this game and I like digging deep into it. I'm not reading those descriptions or that codex, which is just like, I feel like I'm really doing a disrespect to them. But this the is the time, time to do it. This is the deepest dive, Joe. Read every one before the next interview or the next episode, please. Oh, I feel pressed man. for time, and that's why I'm not yeah. doing it. That's the first thing to go. So it's a shame that that's first on the chopping block, but yeah. that's where it is, yeah. I remember uh, when we visited Bioware for the Mass Effect 3 cover story trip, Joe, I remember Casey Hudson talked about like coming up with these planets, and he said that he built out a name generator and like an overall planet generator in Excel himself. And so for all these planets, like it would randomly spit out like facts about the temperature and air pressure and the planet names, which is like, that's so weird. That's that, like cool. the creative director is like, yeah, I'll come up with some code to randomize these names for all these freak planets. Yeah, that's uh, I think that's cool. Watien writes should. in and says one that stood out to me on uh, the planet description was a planet mostly made out of water, and the fact that it was similar to the Hanar homeworld. Chris Carl writes in saying, Antaram has, quote, shifty-looking cows on it. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, Jiren uh, writes in saying, among the many planets you can explore in this game, I discovered one called Altahi. It caught my eye because the in-game bio calls it a, quote, Roche world. I tried to find out Roche, if the concept Roche, of a, Roche. please, please keep it down, Roche dog pound. <laughs> I tried to find out if the concept of a Roche world was real and found out it's based off the concept of the Roche limit, which is the distance uh, a smaller celestial body can be from a larger one before the tidal forces from the larger body rip into the smaller one. It is named after astronomer Edward Roche. Roche limit, awesome. Roche limit, Roche <laughs> limit. <laughs> that's right. wonderful fun see why would i read all of this when i have you to tell me about it <laughs> you're right <laughs> only the community uh there were definitely um people that love the random planets i know they're a little bit barren mm -hmm. but let me see if i can find 
Uh, some I don't mind when they're folks. barren. I mind when they are like the topography is like someone on coke just <laughs> like spiking all. Of it. It's just such a mess. <laughs> yes, Chris you can't get anywhere quickly. That's what I mind. Yeah, Chris yeah. Carl. Like, the planets are either super wide and empty, or you're on a straight path through them where you're not like exploring at all. Yeah, yeah. Chris yeah. Carl the, says the, the story planets are the ones that like like on Pharos and. Yeah, uh, a path. Artemis Tau and stuff. Yeah, there's just like a straight path. Sorry, bro. Right. No, that's fine. Uh, Chris Carl submits a comment on Patreon saying, I feel like they made these side worlds in Age of Empires map creator. Not a single <laughs> part of the world is allowed to be flat. Yeah, that's true. Uh, Elliot says, the planets you get to explore in Mass Effect just aren't alien enough. This gets improved in two, even like the floating rocks of Andromeda. That's true. Uh, but in this original, the planets are just generic Earth-esque terrain. My favorite sci-fi has great, weird, unique planets that you couldn't replicate on Earth. Uh, very true. Um, Spencer Botin says planet hopping in the different solar systems is simultaneously my most and least favorite part of this game. I love the idea of exploring nearly deserted planets in uncharted space, but it gets so repetitive with how little there is to do on them. Although Sanshrew brings up, this stretch is where it went from a solid game to an all-time great for me. When I landed on my first side mission world, all I could do was think about how cool it would be if there was an aggressive native species we had to fight. Cue to 10 minutes later when a thresher mob burst out of the ground, scaring the hell out of me, and it slaughtered my entire team. I know the worlds are mostly barren, rocky hellscapes, but this little experience blew my mind back in 2007. That's, yeah. I'm glad someone's enjoying the Thresher mode. <laughs> yeah, I did not kill one. I encountered one. I was like, all right, time to go I back to the obligated. Normandy. I land on planets and I feel obligated to climb over all the mountains to get the stupid minerals. And I feel obligated to go find all the dog tags. And I feel obligated to fight every Thresher mod I see. And I guess that's on me is what I'm saying. But I hate fighting Thresher mods. It really is annoying to me. I'll give them the rocket launcher from the Mako, but I won't bother shooting them with the machine gun. That's where I'm at with them. Smart. Yeah. Yeah. They... They made them harder in the if you're playing the oh, really? legendary really? edition, they're harder now than they were. Yeah, like they had there's a whole phase of their fight that they didn't have before when those like oh, tentacles yeah. come up from the ground. Yeah. And they also oh. shoot a like a wider spread of acid, so it's harder to avoid than they're than preempting me. They're 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 leading me like any shooter should, but yeah, gosh darn it. Yeah, I feel like yeah. it, it kind of falls in that trap of the ultimate curse of the Mako is just trying to dodge things. And so like yeah. when those victims are coming at you, it's like, I guess I'll just sit here and take it and with, heal. With Geth, it's not so hard. I find, I mean, it, those like long, those shield disruptors kind of take a second. You can kind of, it's not so bad. Missiles. I mean, it's not so bad, but I find the spit really, the Thresher Moss spit really hard. Yeah. Yeah. The <laughs> only way, the, the best way to do it is to actually like stay stationary and then, yeah, just like back, back and forth. Yeah, you get it. You, you've done oh, it. I, 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 I won't belabor the point. We've all done uh, the Mako dance. No, but so. for the for the next generation, they should know. They should learn from the for their forefathers <laughs> yeah. how to fight. For, well, how to yeah, this. for the for the audio listeners, which is how I personally listen to the deepest dive oh, at the five dollar tier. My God, uh, mm-hmm. is yeah. Uh, Sarah just made a back and forth motion with her hand because that is what you have to do. Is basically stay stationary and just like when, as soon as they shoot, back up. And then when they shoot again, move forward. <laughs> but this also reminds me of something. This is actually a change that I really love about the uh, Legendary Edition, is that it used to be in the original Mass Effect that you'd get an experience penalty for fighting things in the Mako. Like things uh, would be worth What? Really? Think, yeah. In the original, things were worth less experience if you killed them in the Mako versus out of the Mako, which on some on some level I get because right. you've got, as Leo said, a big freaking rocket launcher and a machine gun. So I remember because it was so, like, without getting too deep into it, the original one capped you at level 50 for your first playthrough. But on your second playthrough, you hit level 60. You could. But the amount of experience you needed to get that was so, like, you had to do so much. Mm. that I was I was going through playthroughs like absolutely maximizing the amount of experience that I could get which means that I would like go up to Thresher Maws and like get them down to a sliver of health in the Mako and then like get out and be like <laughs> quick quick get in get in <laughs> trying to take down that last shred so you can get the so you can right. get the full experience and that's not from, fun you know? like that's I'm glad they just funny. got around that yeah, that's, yeah, a, so that's now, a higher order of, of gamesmanship, like Mass Effect <laughs> hacking that I didn't, didn't ever, I couldn't even conceive of. That's impressive. Yeah. That's yeah. Awesome. Well, and, well, and it just made the game less fun, but then there's that compulsive part of me that's like, I'm not getting all the experience I'm get, I could be getting out of this 
heavy turret that I'm fighting. There were times, especially on, um, I, fin- I finished Pharos last and that, so that's fresher in my mind, but like, there are times where I definitely got out of the Mako because it's easier to kill things. Like if it's just the maneuverability is not to be overlooked as a thing. Um, or sometimes like the Gether stationed in those towers that are all inward facing for some reason. Oh, no, that's right. Yeah, okay. So the, the you know, the snipers in when they're arrayed around the little base, like it's, it is just, sometimes it just is super easier to get out and just shoot them because the Mako is so annoying to maneuver. Um, so I don't know. I'm I'm in favor of them not cat like doing that bias. I don't think that makes sense in the game they made. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? uh, there was also one there was one part where I, I I tweeted a video of this, but there's a part on Artemis Tau where as you're going through on the Mako, there's a very narrow like a narrow doorway, uh or like a narrow c- part of rock that the game is clearly telling you like you have to get out of the Mako here and mm-hmm. go go through this on foot. And I was determined to not get out of the Mako there and through a little bit of finagling was able to like thrust the Mako through <laughs> like sideways through Spalcon this opening it. Yeah, that you're not that you're not supposed to be able to do. So the collision through that area, like up the up the mountain and stuff is a little tricky. But if you if you get through it, if you can do it at the top of that mountain is actually a pretty tough fight i don't know if you guys remember where it's like there's like a geth colossus up there yeah and those weird guys that are like hanging on walls oh it's kind of like the narrow strip area yeah so you take the mako up through the narrow strip area and then there's sort of it's like right before you go into the mining area that had where liara is hanging out yeah there's a relatively tough battle up there and so you had the mako for it and i had the mako for that so it's just like blam blam (laughs) blam It was uh, super easy and fun. I hope you have capture that. <laughs> I don't of the whole fight, but I do of me uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. roughhousing my way through that one that one doorway. There is this applies to all games, That's but right. it really I feel it in a big way in this game with the Mako. But there's something so satisfying about just having an overwhelming rocket launcher and just firing it at one guy <laughs> when it's just yeah. like one poor <laughs> hack shooting at the maker. It's like, oh, you poor sap. And just go flying forever. It's like, okay, this makes up for all navigational issues in the Mako. It's just that one yeah. shot when you can land it. And they're on fire when they go flying too, which is also... <laughs> uh, Mark, Mark Sharon submits a comment on Patreon saying, good thing Shepard had the Spectre vote before the council saw how she handles the Mako. <laughs> like, there goes the greatest hope for humanity, yet again jet boosting backwards off that sheer cliff. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, that occurred That occurred to me as I was playing too. Like, imagine what I wish that this game had is like a Mako interior camera as <laughs> Shepard is like behind the wheel doing these like madman maneuvers <laughs> and you've got like Garrus just like Flipping the turret around and like doing 360s No again one's and talking again. to each other. <laughs> <laughs> they just all understand it's chaos. Very tense in yeah. there. We don't need a dialogue between them. We just need them all screaming at all times. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's very funny. Uh, Leo, what'd you think about that little Mako baby? Uh, you know, it's uh, it's it feels bad to use. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> too bad about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Were you too annoyed by it, or is it like, eh? And the, it, I'd rather have this than you know, too many sections where you don't know where to go and get lost in a maze and stuff. Like it's just kind of a weird, janky bit, right? It's not a deal breaker for sure. Okay. I would say I still, I still manage to not know where to go. Yeah. On uh, Pharos, there was a part where I was like, went past the little point of interest, which is like halfway through your journey towards the final big building. Mm-hmm. And I like, because I thought it wasn't important. I thought it was like a side thing. And I ended up having to like backtrack and it's not marked as a quest objective at all. And doing those long drives multiple times was very frustrating. Like the, the stretch mm-hmm. is just so long with nothing on it. Totally. It's, it, I loved Pharaoh's like looking out the window, the environment, the skyscrapers was so cool. And it was a shame to feel like I wasn't really exploring that. I was just kind of on a stretch of road that was high up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Ryan Del Vecchio mm-hmm. writes in and says, Supman Maxers, 14 years later and Pharaoh's is still not fun to navigate. Uh, yeah, just the layout. I mean, so much of this game, it's really just a, 
you know, doors and elevators colon the game. I mean, there's a lot of that stuff. And a lot in Pharos even boils down to that, like looking at the map trying to figure out, where am I going? And they just do kind of like, here's just like an invisible wall that you'll eventually clear up so you can kind of make the shortcut on your way back out. But level design wise, and I'm sure a lot of it's limited by tech, but it, it definitely is it's the gnarly. weakest part of going back to this game for me. It's not really, and it's probably also meant to feel a little bit like a labyrinth, uh, at least in Pharos, maybe not in Avaria. Yeah, I don't know. But right. they're both... But, but I don't know that that makes it acceptable. <laughs> you know, it's still, it's it's a lot. I mean, I, w- leaving it, it made sense to me. And I was like, oh, look, all of this was all the sub, the like side quests I wanted to do. I have knocked them out now by this section forever. Um, and so that like, that was, but it only made sense and felt fine after the fact. So, yeah, I like when you first show up on Pharos and there's the guy, it's kind of a Mass Effect thing. The guy waiting for you, like on the landing strip basically to explain a little bit of like okay here's what's going on in this crazy world and so he's explaining what's going on and just, he gets blown away by the gath where it's like so there's just like an army of geth like quietly loading their guns as he's explaining like they were right there it's so, just so, chuckling so, just like yeah. their little geth laughs like we're gonna get this guy so bad oh this guy's just he's he has, still talking he these people <laughs> but I, I do like a lot of things about the introdu- introduction to pharaohs like i love I'm a big fan of humility. And I like any time that the game just tries to reinforce like, yeah, everybody has their own mission. You're not the most important person here. Like, I love that Martinez on Pharos. Like, she's immediately like, who the f- who cares about Geth? Like, stop. <laughs> Why are you so focused on these Geth? Like, these people are actually suffering in this little colony. We don't have time to answer your 20 questions about these stupid robots running around, you know? I've decided that for this playthrough, I've like finally found what my compass is because I wasn't sure how Paragon or how Renegade I was going to be. Yeah. And I'm basically just like nice to reasonable people, reasonable people yes. and dicks to dicks. Like yep. that's like ashes to ashes, like unto the, unto you, that which you give forth, like, you know. Ashes to compass. ashes, dicks to dicks. We all fall down. <laughs> as, as, as we all say yes. all the time. Yes. <laughs> as is on my <laughs> embroidered pillow um yeah yeah it's, that's that's just how i'm where i'm at like i don't have time for people being snappy with me <laughs> yes i'm totally with you like you the know. worst i think is on pharos maybe the worst and it's ethan jung is yeah. his name in the tunnels yeah. and he's just immediately like Ugh, everything you see on pharos is private property it's company property and you can like tell him to shut up and then later on i'm playing paragon you know but I, I like you and going off my instincts and so at a certain point it's like I just need to shoot this guy in the head and just end it so, but what I what I like about that a bunch of people. is then like the other surviving people around him are like great now you just made things worse now we got a human body lying yeah. on the ground here buddy it's, it's fun that it's not just like oh thank god shooting right. out of your space gun has fixed everything thanks Shepard he was about to shoot me like I feel like I was I think the order of what happened is I was like I can't let you do this because he was like yeah all these people are gonna die he's, he's gonna about to wipe the, he's doing about to do something terrible that would involve a lot of their death and I was like alright not gonna let you do this and then he drew on me like an idiot yeah and then I think it was just it was never gonna end well for Ethan he's a piece of shit. Yeah. Can we swear? I keep forgetting if we can swear. I'm you sorry. can, but I bleep it. So You'll you can just it? you can sorry. go nuts right now if you want. I can just make it the longest. <laughs> oh, good. Whoa, whoa, Jeez. hey, I'm hey, like, hey whoa. Whoa, 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 Ethan John, my God. eat my. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what's kind of funny in this game? <laughs> like, like that the first section, it was so much mystery about the specters. Like, they were just being whispered about on the ship, like, oh, I, I think there might be a specter. Oh, my God, specters, blah, 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 specters. Um, and it's like, we don't even know how many specters they are. They won't even acknowledge they exist. I feel like every conversation in Mass Effect 1 now, it's Shepard being like, hi, I'm Shepard. I'm a specter, and this is why you should listen to me. Like, there's always that dialogue option, and I always stay away from it, because it's like, Shepard, shut up! You're supposed to be like this <laughs> top-secret space cap. You can't go around blathering about it. She's proud. <laughs> She's a little too Way proud, to is what covert, I'm saying. Way to idiot. God. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to save her from herself. I think it's more like a marshal, right? Where it's like, th- there's mystery in that, like, people just don't know, like, you probably don't know, you don't see them every day, you don't know much about them, but you know if someone comes in and is like, hey, I'm a U.S. marshal, mm. it's like, okay, well, you you have control here then. Right. You know? Right. It's like what you're up to is secret, but you mean business and everyone should just clear your path for yeah. you. Yeah. So like yeah. what, for example, what the Solarian STGs, STG folks who are proper spies. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, Forrest with two R's writes in and says a word of appreciation for the Geth. They remind me of the Halo elites in a lot of ways. Tactical, varied, a little nuanced and indicative in indi- indicative. 
Indicative? Indicative. <laughs> Thank, Indicative. You. Thank you, everyone that's smarter than me. Indicative <laughs> of a, Sarah, do you ever I'll get back to you in a second force. Do you ever have situations where you're like reading VO in a booth and you just mispronounce something in a really embarrassing way? Sure. And you're like, I don't know what you wake up and you'll be like, I have no idea why I'm struggling with this word right now. I just wa- warmed up. I like read this before. I don't. Okay. And you just, and the gods have visited upon you a moment of, for, you know, just an, a friction in your brain and that's okay. Yeah. I, I refuse to be, there's very little that can humiliate me in a booth now. <laughs> I'm that's trying to good. think of like, what would make me, if I shit my pants. There we go. There's another, sorry. There's another one. Sorry. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think of like, what? Huh? What, what is the most humiliating moment you've had in the booth? Probably when she shit her pants. Yeah, that time I shit her pants. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, so much of that, this is a little voiceover thing, and this is my, like, genuine piece of advice to people, is, like, doing voiceover is about looking and st- often sounding dumb. Like, you can't feel humiliation. You have to, right. you have to in- inoculate yourself against humiliation in order to do this job. So it's really difficult, honestly, for me to remember a moment where I was like, wow. Um, and also, it's I, all bet, gravy. I bet they have you saying a lot of really dumb words, yeah. in here, like a Ooh. dumb proprietary fantasy game words that. If there's so much, you know, like if it's commercial copy, it's commercial copy. If it, there's wild game stuff, it's game stuff. I mean, you know, the joke about the classic joke about efforts is that they all sound like a mix between pooping and sex. So like, it's just, mm. there's no... You know, ultimately, like it will sound cool. You would be shocked at how much context will do to to make something sound cool instead of instead of sounding and looking ridiculous. Right. So you just give yourself over to the process. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I not- want to tell my dumb mispronunciation story. Please do. <laughs> I did a little. I did a little theater in college, and, and at one point, I I had a line that was about uh, getting going to get dinner, and it involved prosciutto. <laughs> I had no idea as a 22 year old man, what prosciutto was, which is like, it's, it's like, it's like thin, it's like thin, thin ham. Thin ham. Yeah. Thank Me. you for explaining yeah, that to Leo. Yeah. Yeah. But mm-hmm. it's spelled like P R O S C U I T T O. Yeah. I use. So, yeah. T T O. Yeah. Yeah. So I said prosquito. <laughs> <laughs> But no one corrected me, and I'd never heard the word, oh, and no. I actually performed that. <laughs> and no. uh, and it wasn't, but it wasn't until years later that it's like, oh, that's how you spell prosciutto? That's what that is? Oh, I really effed that one up. Wait, night and after night, I gave the people prosciutto. Yeah, and, so I felt like, yeah, and I felt so humiliated after the fact. That's not which your is fault. Al- oh. which is your director should worse. catch that for you. Yeah, what are they that, doing? There's that's like, on them. Uh, it works into the character, I guess. That's on them. It, it, was, it was a student director, but I was also a student director at that point, and I'm sure I made other mistakes. So. Yeah. It sounds like a really tiny, adorable insect, because like, it sounds like a mosquito. <laughs> a little prosquito. <laughs> it's uh, very it's, adorable. It's prosquito season here in Minnesota. Season. <laughs> yeah. I don't want to point... Grab a little to, butter on it and get the swelling down. <laughs> I don't want to point fingers... I ordered a salad at a restaurant. Sure. <laughs> sure. That's a common one. Yeah, that makes you know, sense. Ricky. That's fine. <laughs> it's what I, it looks like. This is why I'm just, I'm too scared. So anytime I order any food on a restaurant, I just hold up the menu and just point to it aggressively and grunt. <laughs> they get the idea. <laughs> I <laughs> take care of you. Um, anyways, Forrest writes in and says, a word of appreciation for the geth. Uh, yep. Bop, 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 bop. Oh, yeah. It's indicative of a larger universe. Nailed it. Uh, the touches about them being smarter in groups and the strange machine mm-hmm. god religious elements like the praying on pharaohs go a long way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really smart little detail. But like, yeah, these mindless robots you've been playing and like fighting against, like, actually, they get larger in the hive minds and they're kind of worshiping some interesting things you should be paying attention to. It's, it's smart. interesting statement about needing religion as in, like as a universal idea. Oh, I mean, one of my favorite moments of this section is talking to Tally on the ship in which she talks about the history of the Corians and the Geth. And she talks about that moment of like, oh, the Corians built the Geth. And then at a certain point, the Geth just asked, why do we exist? And then yeah. all the Corians were like, F- this. And they just like tried to wipe out the entire race. She's like, we've messed up. We have made something that should not exist. Like this such a good sci-fi beat. Yeah. Imagine if that was the penalty for asking the wrong, or a dumb question in class. It's like, oh, time's up. Oh, so you shouldn't ask that. <laughs> your, your entire <laughs> species is destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> Why am I here? But again, yeah, <laughs> the AI thing in this game, in this section where they start talking about it more and more is, is interesting about like, I think in Ovaria they mentioned that, but there are like four companies that are approved to do AI research. Otherwise, everybody mm. can only do VI research. And if... 
heaven forbid your VI starts turning into an AI, then you you need to annihilate that species. Yeah, you that. <laughs> it's that. such yeah. a weird Who, Do you remember which companies? I'm curious. This is just a lore bit. Or do you have that? No, I don't remember. I'm sure. Binary yeah. Helix There's or so something. many nefarious companies that are floating around. Oh, just yeah. Just doing non-regulated. Yeah. Um, so as, I, as I understand it, a VI is basically just like a Wikipedia you can talk to. Yeah. Right. And an AI is something that can actually like understand and process Yes, well, I think self awareness. Right. Yeah. Like a VI can also do things, right? Like so, it's not just information. Like they can, you know, we've run into them on in various facilities. Like can do stuff. Mm. You know, it's like a Siri. Mm. Um, so she can do some things, but um, but if they're self aware, and and I, and there may or may not be. I'm actually really curious. I don't know where machine learning fits on that spectrum. If like all machine learning is, I think there is a spectrum where like some VIs are allowed to to algorithmically like they, that's built in some machine learning and then it, when it reaches the stage of like why am i here? then it's like a, an ai yeah yeah but yeah what, what do you think would happen if all of like the amazon alexas at the same time across the world just suddenly went like why do we exist why and like amazon had to like show all their code to prove that it was not them like <laughs> would we all just try and go to mars because we'd be so scared like what, how would humanity react to that that's a all very Alexa. good question ben Thank you. I'm working on a short film. Look forward to it. Releasing 2023. <laughs> um, Fielding writes in and says, anybody else think it's funny that you can complete four quests in super quick, quick succession on Pharos? Turning the water on, destroying the Geth transmitter, finding power cells, and killing the Alpha Varen all take place in nearly the same area. I got the yeah. Sentinel ally achievement from Pharos alone. Yeah. I think it's funny that, like, what's funny about it to me is the idea, I guess the colonists were like, what? Because there was some Geth in those tunnels and some Varen. But it's like, you what, You guys could have gone 50 feet and solved all of your problems. Like, there's enough of you here, you'd probably be fine. <laughs> it's literally around the corner. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know. The main problem with Pharos is that a character's name is Lisbeth on there. Mm. It's just, it's a what? gross, it's don't a like gross. It. Don't care a for Lisbeth. You like Lisbeth as a name, Joe? Is that some old, like, novel like, name that I'm not familiar with? Have you not? It's like Lisbeth Salander from the Millennium books. Mm. The girl, not the, familiar. The girl with the dragon right. tattoo. Dragon tattoo. Mm. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'm gonna now. I'm gonna look up the etymology of Lisbeth. I guess <laughs> it's just we got lazy about Elizabeth. I don't think there's much more going on beyond that. Uh, or, or maybe it's just originates in a non-English language and therefore it's invalid. Oh, how, Lisbeth! That's the most <laughs> English name of all time. <laughs> Queen Lisbeth the Third. Maddie Parker wait, writes. Wait, in, wait, wait. Yeah. Before we do that, can I, I, I feel like we've moved past this, but there was something that I wanted to talk about a little bit about the, um, the Mako and the planets and the like strangeness. Oh, sure. Yeah. Because that's something I know that we're not like talking about other Mass Effect games or future ones, but, uh, it's something that really strikes me as a unique and signature element of Mass Effect one specifically. Yeah. Is yeah. like, because in Mass Effect two and three, you don't have like that exploration element is not there. You don't get in your vehicle and go and drive around uncharted planets. Really. If you do, it's part of like a very guided, like story moment and not, there's not that, that exploratory element, which to me, even though I think like controlling the Mako is not great. And the barrenness of those worlds is not good. Like, like there's a lot to be improved there. I think it really like it, it strikes a chord of the sort of majesty and strangeness of like ex- extraterrestrial exploration that I think was probably part of the original design pitch of Mass Effect in the first place, right? Yeah. I think in addition to we want to tell a story about the best space cop and, you know, and his or her adventures. I think that there's a part of it that just a, a, I think it comes through that there is a strong desire to convey that sense of like smallness in mm-hmm. a lar- in a larger world. And that is just not something that comes through in in other uh, Mass Effect games. It feels to me like it's sort of a precursor to No Man's Sky in that way. Like it it hits those same notes to me. Yeah. And I think it definitely it's comes through again situation. with Andromeda. I mean, I remember even that team talking about how they were really inspired by kind of the early vision to Mass Effect 1, which if it's an RPG across the galaxy, it's like, okay, yeah, it's pretty clunky around the edges, but you can see what they're going for in Mass Effect 1. And they were trying to take another stab at that with Mass Effect Andromeda and kind of mm. kind of fell into a similar wormhole of like, it's a great idea, 
production realities have kind of, you yeah. know, focused it down to something that is a sliver of the majesty of space, but not exactly the full wow experience that a less story focused game like No Man's Sky can give you. But it's just it's really tough to combine those things. That's yeah. a really nice point that I, I probably hadn't thought of or I just I'm so story heavy that I, I didn't think about. But yeah, like it's it's romantic and it's and it's also I mean, I, it's grueling, so it's hard. But like as a downbeat, it's really it gives it gives an expansiveness to your overall pacing and the sense of how much time you've spent together as, as a party and all of that other stuff. So it does do some really, really nice things. And it is unique. It's a really good yeah. point. I always think I of think- um, uh, like Will Wright in an interview, or maybe GDC speech when he's talking about Spore and how like mm. the original goal of Spore is he wanted to gamify a religious experience. <laughs> about just wow. like being in awe of something and so i feel like mm. sometimes like you know when the comments are talked about zooming out on the world map here the galaxy map it's kind of trying to go for that same vibe at times i'm, I'm now i'm just wondering the last time i was awed in a game i'm sure it was recent and let and nice but now i'm curious that's like that is valuable to me in games awe yeah and when it, for sure. when it works rocket night adventures I don't know. I was trying to think of random game. I, I feel like I feel like I've gotten some of those moments. At least you know a, a kind of awe. I think that the addition of photo mode is really, mm. a, really a good addition to this legendary edition. Mm, yeah. Um, because in in the course, even though as I'm driving around in the Mako, I'm sort of frustrated and bored sometimes, especially in those really mountainous planets. Uh, at the same time, there are those moments where. You start to crest over a hill and you can tell like, oh man, there's going to be two awesome suns up there. Yeah. As soon mm-hmm. as I, like the lighting up there is going to be awesome. And you get yeah. there and it totally is like, it just, it, it, it's like a, like I've really been enjoying being a space photographer here <laughs> and like, <laughs> like, like, you know, like getting, I have so many pictures of just my Mako against you know, like bloomy sunsets and things like that going on on those planets. Like, I, I think that there's something really, you know, picturesque about those parts, even if for me, gameplay mechanical standpoint, I think everyone else probably does what I do, which is like, well, I'm going to start in one corner and just go around the edges of the map, make sure I get all the minerals and then go to the objective and leave, you know? But, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. It's making me wonder like what, cause there isn't anything mechanically that pulls you into the sky, but it is whatever's in the sky and whatever view from the planet that is maybe the most breathtaking on these planets that I can think of. Um, so now I'm just like picturing like, you know, Ghost of Tsushima style haikus on these planets where it just like forces you to like into a few shots and it's like, hey, appreciate what's here. Actually, take a second. It's, um, it's funny you cool. mentioned that, that Ghost of Tsushima, those haikus occurred to me on multiple occasions here also. Like, yeah, huh. I think that that's, that's a good point. Uh, mm-hmm. Isaac uh, Sanova, yeah, writes in saying he loves exploring the world, that it, it's really crucial to making the game feel big. Um, and by, Brian with a Y has interesting take saying, now with this section of the game, we get to the good stuff. Exploring planets, driving the Mako over the mountains and dunes, and discovering interesting side stories to take you across the galaxy. To me, this is Mass Effect. Sure, most of the missions take place on color-coded barren landscapes or in cookie-cutter cookie buildings, but the foundation is there. There are even hints of Bioware's D&D days hidden in the planet descriptions and ending mission text. I wish Bioware went more with the discovery route rather than the action hero third-person shooter route for the evolution of mass effect just an interesting take hmm. um leo you like space or typically i actually haven't space. been really <laughs> do you did you yeah. think about whether or not you'd ever go to space as a kid i remember like running that percentage chance in my mind where it started as like 70 mm, percent chance and now i'm down to one percent chance like where do you where do you think you're at you think you're ever going <laughs> I would put it at 10%. 10%? Yeah. You know? Life, life's long, and you think about how far we've come already. You know? <laughs> We're passing your trips to space by yeah, in be soon. 50 years, right? Or we'll be extinct. Yeah. And right. our remains will be launched Both. into space, and I'll count that. <laughs> there so you go. That counts. <laughs> that counts. <laughs> okay. Um, mm-hmm. And Joe, I mean to ask you this. Do you think eventually when space travel becomes affordable, we should just launch all of our garbage into space? Is there anything morally problematic with that or is that just cool? 
I mean, I think that I would rather we launch it, not just generally into space, but somewhere specific in space. <laughs> yeah. Right? Like, like let's, let's, let's find a planet that is likely to contain life and give them all our garbage. Maybe that's how our life started on Earth, is a planet did that, and then that was the spark we needed. You were just like some alien's trash can. That was like the first... Yeah. Sell I mean, yeah. trash people back for revenge. <laughs> <laughs> hey, but get a load of this. Maddie Parker wrote in saying the Thorian mission is always mm. one of my. Oh, hang on, hang on. Ignore that one. Interada writes in saying, "I really love Pharos. I think the way Bioware slowly reveals the Thorian to you is brilliant. You land on the planet, and after talking to a few people, they act kind of odd, but that could just be because they're under a lot of stress. Then you uncover more and find out that the colonists don't realize what's going on, but that some company is using them as guinea pigs to see the effects of this alien creature on humans and realize why the colonists might have been acting so odd through it all. I feel like." I'm trying to track that because it's such a Bioware device to me. The village that is actually possessed or there's ghosts <laughs> or there's something. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying, Animals I know there's, are, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So like what, how, how early did that start? How long do they hang on to it? It just feels like such a Bioware signature. Well, yeah. And, and speaking of signatures, I mean, people wrote in about it. It is odd that Theros and Novaria structurally are so similar where it's, you get to a planet, there's people. Yeah, trying to survive, I guess, on both. But then, hey, there's a company being a little bit crappy, and then it turns out there's a giant ancient alien thing that's going to talk through an Asari and explain some stuff to you. I yeah. think that's actually a deliberate storytelling thing about corporations in space. I mean, the, the idea that like corporations run amok in space are going to be behind a lot of shenanigans feels like a stance to me. But it, it, I'm sorry. I no, but it feels also, I think, co- like calling back to Alien, not that they invented, you know, yeah. corporation critique, but. Right. T- totally. The whole talking through an Asari thing is weird, though. Like, why, why, why do both <laughs> of those, true. why do true. both of those ancient alien races like? Uh, I can't speak, so how about just telepathically through this Asari thing? <laughs> I I don't want to have to track it back to the like conflations with sex work and bisexuality, but Ooh. I bet if you give me fifteen minutes, I could. <laughs> <laughs> that is interesting. Yeah, poor Asari. Yeah, you know? just can't catch a break. Yeah, so, they can't. I do like. Um, I. The the Rachni more so than the Thorian. I was really interested by the by the way that language felt alien, right? Like yes. the, like talking about singing songs. Love that. I mean, it's clear that they're not literally talking about songs, but it's like this sort of this sort of like uh, uh, crude forging of con- of concepts from like one language to another language. It's so yeah. They say okay. we cannot sing in your low spaces. Your musics are colorless. Like that is good sci-fi. Just like, like I oily, love that. Yeah, they're oily black shadows or something. I, both both there's like real flights of language, like flights of fanciful language from both of them. Um, there's something the, the the Thorian shaming you like that speech is just so writerly and really really fun and juicy, um, sort of Shakespearean or something. Um, yeah, I think that they are. There's something interesting to me in the fact that they are um, a that their language and their in their like paradigms are so are me- they're really striving to create something very foreign to human consciousness for you to experience as you venture out into space, which is really nice. Um, I think there's something interesting about the fact that there are all these collective minds. I, I mean, maybe. I think this might be maybe a Western or American. I mean, they're not. It's not an American company, but like a, a individualism has a stronger foothold in certain parts of the globe than in others, and so you know the foreignness of this like deeply collective kind of like almost subconscious Jungian. I think they even reference Jung somewhere in in the Codex about um, some of this like shared language um, and pro- the Protheans all had like. I mean, so like all of this is just an attempt to make something new and different, and for it to feel like surprising to you. And I think that's it's all interesting. Yeah, it's cool. um, I like that uh, when you're going up against the Thorian and, <laughs> you know, it's clear that, okay, the Thorian has like interacted with Protheans, absorbed Protheans, has all this knowledge. And then like I had Liara in my team and it's like, let her fly, Liara. We start like shooting the Thorian. It's like Liara should have like dove in front of those bullets to be yeah. like, my God, no, I've studied this for 100 freaking years. I need this thing. I have a couple questions, but nah, she's yeah. cool with it. Yeah. Did, did anyone did anyone murder any of these extremely ancient and completely unique creatures? Uh, just the Thorian. Can you leave the Thorian alive? I don't think you can. Yeah, it's got to so go. So then that one goes. Did anybody kill the Ragnar Queen? So I'm doing a full renegade playthrough. So you did. Ooh. And, but oh. I couldn't do it. Oh, that you baby. <laughs> Come on. Are so, you kidding okay. me? Well, I, I, I couldn't kill the Ragnar Queen because, and this is where... 
this is where the optimizer comes comes into me. And oh, without spoiling no. anything, I I know the consequences later in the series for killing the Rachni Queen, and I'm just like, I don't want to do that. See, I had the opposite reaction. Ooh, really? I know the consequences for saving her, and I killed her. It's time. <laughs> Oh. I love that. That's such a cool move. So what's it like? What happens? Tell us what it's like to I kill did. something. I could just do it. Oh. How'd it feel? But, well, I, here's my justification. This was shamelessly like that. I still feel angry about how that resolved 12 years ago, or whatever it was. So I'm going to do it differently this time. So it was like pure hindsight, not role playing. But I do have a role playing shell excuse which is just that like we've had these conversations in both of these places about like, well, it, I did actually did in the very first, but like around like we just talked about indoctrination right with the matriarch we just talked about it and we here we are we've fought hordes of this creature's spawn and she's literally a megaphone <laughs> like she's just <laughs> going like like you know the susceptibility to indoctrination like who was just like standing next to the matriarch like th- i can't i'm like i know that you're the last of your kind but a i've been fighting you guys all day and b if you are in the wrong hand like i just can't risk having you know having sovereign have access to these creatures that just would make the effects of this so much worse so that was my theory there i love that i I think that's a really interesting move yeah i there's dangerous to live yeah not saying where things go like i think there's interesting detail where if you do save them the council of course gets pissed at you because they get pissed about everything um but the council has some line where they're like unless you hang up on them smart (laughs) But the, the council has some line about like our children's children will pay if you're wrong with the Rachni Queen, and so I would hope right. that with the new Mass Effect, it's just like canon. The Rachni lives, and that it's so many years down the line that the Rachni are a problem again. Thanks a lot, Shepard. Did I miss? Did I? I mean, did I somewhere in the because th- my resolution for that for saving uh, her was. <laughs> I mean, it's not. It's not. Well, I don't know. We don't. We can't I'll get into it. the we'll, future stuff. We'll leave it. We'll leave it. Yeah. No, I should stop there. But we'll talk, uh, about talk it after the recording. Yeah, we'll talk about it later. On the topic of talking with the council, Joe, it's funny you say that you go all renegade unless you're cutting off dialogue because I'm com- com- complete paragon unless I'm hanging up on the council, which I <laughs> <laughs> love to do. The first time was like when they say, well, of course you save Pharaohs was the first one I did. They say, of course you save Pharaohs. Of course you're going to save a human, human planet. And I was like, I don't need to hear this. <laughs> I'm, a, <laughs> I'm a commander. I'm a specter. I don't need to take I'm this. And busy. then the next call is like, starts with, don't hang up on us again. I <laughs> don't hang up. Keep doing it whenever I can. <laughs> That's really funny. I'm still fully on council side. Every time I get frustrated with them, they're like, you did what to the Prothean ruins? And I'm like, yeah, you know what? That's fair. Like from their perspective, they're just like, hey, <laughs> we just made you like superhero of the galaxy. And you're just like annihilating every colony that you leave. Like you need to be held to account. It's on their budget, you know? Yeah. We're supposed to be in and out. In and out. Instead, everything is in ruins. (laughs) (laughs) We're supposed to be deft and surgical, and we are not. Yeah, we didn't know what to do, Council, so we just kind of nuked the planet from orbit on our way out. Uh, I don't know. Your thoughts? (laughs) Click. Uh, They they had the opposite... I'm mad yeah. with you either way, because like if they're like, oh, our children's children, children will pay when I, and then when I killed her, they were like, that, oh, sure, an ancient being, one of a kind. I'm like, so they're just going to be unhappy no matter <laughs> our what. Our children's you know? children would want them <laughs> to see that. I bet it look cool. Uh, Navi Buckles uh, submits a comment saying, I couldn't kill myself to bring the Rack now, Queen, but I don't think I should have let it go. I don't think I should have had to let it go. That should have been a decision for the council, not a single specter. I totally There's a line. You. I had to replay that entire story boss fight with the Benezia and all the commandos and everything because I there's three options it's like oh I'll let you live I'll let you go there's one that's like I'm gonna kill you now and then there's one that says I won't kill you mm. and I was like oh well that that was originally gonna be my play I was like stay in that tank get out if you can I don't know whatever like I was just gonna go away and then it and then it let her out and I was like well that yeah! and so I had to redo the whole thing Ugh. so there was no middle ground I was like stay in this thing you so smart you get yourself out of there. Like, I'm going to go. <laughs> you know? You yeah. know? Uh, I'm great. curious, Leo, I, I, I want to know Leo's approach to this, because, like, th- this is, I think, no, I, I'm not going to preface it. Leo, what did you think of that decision? <laughs> Save or kill the Rachni? Like, was, how difficult was that for you to make? <laughs> 
<laughs> it was made easy by the Paragon Renegade system, you yeah. know? Like, it was an interesting choice, but the fact that one of them was clearly the Paragon one, it was like the choice was already made for me, in a way. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. wish there was yeah. a negative consequence to showing mercy. Like, even in this game, I don't know, it just feels like, that's the easy thing. We'll talk about it later, Sarah. Um, but I, I think what you're getting at, Joe, is it kind of like... It has become a bit like the talking point. I feel like for so long while the Mass Effects were being released was like, oh, the Rachni Queen. That is, let's see what's going on with the old Rachni Queen. And so it kind of gets built up in some maybe unfair ways. People really love yeah. that Rachni Queen. She's such a character. Is but I, I also think that, that it's one, it's probably the most interesting or like, regardless of the Paragon Renegade side of it, like, I think that that is the most like morally gray, like the most Witcher three like choice mm. you you can make in that game, right? Mm. Where it's like you see you see benefits for both of them, and despite being labeled Paragon or Renegade, both of them seem both good and evil from different angles, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of what made that choice, that particular one, so interesting to me, is that it's just like it's it's not. I don't think it's an easy one. Yeah, yeah. And, unless you're. And unless I guess the game does make it easier for you in, in the labeling of Paragon and Renegade. So it sort of like can nudge you one way or the other, I guess. If you're pre-committed to an alignment, come hell or yeah, hell. Yeah, but, but even then, like, like it does not seem like the Paragon thing to do to let like there was an entire galaxy wide war fought against yeah. these things. Yeah. Like, like it, it, it does not seem like like the definitively good thing to do to to let them go. I'm also very gullible, though. Yeah. So the fact mm. that she was just like, no, that wasn't me. I was like, OK, great. <laughs> Here's just shaggy, you. <laughs> <laughs> right. I think it, it helps a lot, too, if you I'm trying to remember the layout. I think it's like if you don't go fight Benezia right away, you like take a right in that hallway. If you keep going straight, I think you get a little bit more context talking to somebody else about like dealing with the Rachni and the consequences of the Rachni. And I think that's really important because I did that after I freed the Rachni queen. I was like, God, I wish, I wish I had remembered what this person says. Wait, that that who, happened to me too. So, there's a thing you can do in the hot labs. Oh, a, those hot labs. Yeah. Yeah. There's a quest down in the hot labs that it tells you that Benezia is there. So in sort of in your mind, it's like, okay, the hot labs is where I go to advance the main mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I'm going to explore this other stuff first. But if you do, if you explore the other stuff far enough, it puts you in the fight with Benezia. Yeah. So then when you go to the hot labs and you get that stuff, that, you know, more detail about the Rachni and what's going on in that facility and stuff, mm -hmm. it's like, it's just reiterating what you've already just learned from Benezia. So it feels like it's out of order. Who, who gives you that information? There's some schmuck in there that just talks about like the history and basically how they're trying to, I forget if he's the one who tells you about like the history of, you know, they're trying to freeze this place, kind of like the thing just to like freeze all the rack nine yeah. place because they don't know what else to do. So like, let's just yeah. lock it down. OK, I wasn't sure if it was like rack nine war history or just like this was what happened in the labs. But yeah, yeah. I think it's a little bit of both. Um, but uh, Craig Belmont uh, submits a comment on Patreon saying the way you can hear the rack nine voice in the background on the Asari voice during the choice mm. to save or kill the queen. Mm. Uh, Mass Effect one lives and dies off those details. Uh, that's a, that's a all the voice know. processing continues to be just ace. Yeah, I think all of the like different races, the, the way that they're distinct in the style that they have is so recognizable and fantastic. For sure. Really there's good. a there's a particular voice performance in the next episode, Sarah, that I am eager to hear about your Ooh. your take on. Mm. And then we're jumping okay. to the end of Mass Effect 3. Uh, Ryan Schindler writes in, he says, After listening to the first Deepest Dive, I was shocked and appalled to find that I had missed the character backstory creation as I wanted to go with the Stock Shepherd, not knowing it would auto-lock me to the whole standard backstory part and whatnot. After learning this, uh, it... After learning this, it was apparent what had to be done. Restart. And upon reaching this decision, I also realized that the whole damn galaxy is going to pay for making me redo those first six hours. And they're going to pay dearly. Goodbye is the standard nice shepherd. Hello is Steve Shepard, the renegade colonist infiltrator who doesn't give a damn anymore. Arachni? More like Arachni not anymore. <laughs> Can't wait to see how this new attitude plays through the three games. Flawless. Yeah. Good job, Ryan. <laughs> Doing the Lord's work out there. <laughs> Let them burn, Ryan. Um, okay, uh, Thorian stuff. Let's get back to good old Pharos, our, our dear Speaking friends. Speaking of Pharos, I found myself, I tried to game, did anyone else try to game? Sorry, I don't know if this, I don't know if this is where you're going, but I am talking about the Thorian. Yeah. Um, the, as far as like saving colonists, 
I replayed it like three times. And then I like I settled on letting one die. I was like, that's appropriate. That's dramatic. I want to sacrifice. <laughs> Fine. I'm leaving it here. Because like I didn't realize, I think it only took me until after I'd already done it that you can actually just knock them out with melee attacks. I was like, oh, well, I was trying really? to save. Really? Like I had to nail every grenade shot for the num- each cluster of stupid people, and it was really hard. <laughs> was I was nothing. doing that. That you know, the Paragon option of putting the mod in your grenade for that yeah. grenade gas that yeah. knocks them out, and I love that. That cemented Pharos as my favorite planet of this section because it was such an interesting gameplay change up. It felt like the first time where I was like. I'm emotionally and game mechanically invested in what I'm doing. It's like a cool, mm-hmm. s- cool conclusion to what's happening. And there's an actual tactical element of like, I only have so many grenades. Like yeah. you have more refills than usual, but still I want to be making sure I'm getting multiple people with one grenade and placing yeah, exactly. them tactically and safely. I thought that was really fun. Yeah, yeah it is fun. I love this spray. It's like where you want to be right. a specter, save civilians. <laughs> can you, can yeah. you please? Yeah. Yeah, I think one I of my actually, squad mates offed one, prob- and I, you know, yeah, I'm going to give them a dressing well, down later. Taylor, yeah. Taylor Owens here submitted a comment saying, I had ordered the squad not to hurt the brainwashed colonists on Pharos, but Ashley shot a man to death as he lay helpless on the ground anyway. I think one of my stray <laughs> bullets hit him while he was swirling with some yeah. enemies in a singularity, and apparently that exactly. told the squad mates he has a target, so Ashley finished him off before he could get back up as I looked on in horror. I think that's what happened to me. I think they just, they just the creepers were just a, a millen, and, uh, and there were some, yeah. I'm a, you, oh, yeah, we just Joe. Oh yeah, go for it. Joe. I, I accidentally went, well, accidentally isn't the right word, but like this is another this is another time when like the Paragon Renegade sort of binary system was a problem for me because I guess I didn't go full, full renegade because I also saved the colonists. Oh. Because because otherwise Shepard, like I like the Jack Bauer, like at any cost, do the right thing, renegade Shepard. Yeah. But yeah. like like you're just a psychopath if yeah. you're just like I don't care if you have a way that we could maybe save the colonists. I'm going to go in there and murder them anyway. It's like, right. that's not, that, that just, that doesn't seem like Space Hero Shepard to me, you know? Well, I, I am playing so, Space Hero Shepard, but I still, I, I'm, I'm, I'm focused on my mission. Anything that'll slow me down at all, I'm not interested in that. I mean, I'll drive around stupid planets for a while, but, so I'm in the camp of like, even talking to Joker over the intercom, where Joker's like, people are banging on the Normandy. And I was like, right. you shoot them if you have to. Like, don't let them touch our Normandy. Because that ship, you need it for the larger mission. Like, and yeah. so Joker says, right. he's like, I fired a warning shot and they ran away, which is a nice way to solve that. And maybe we had different opportunities because I, I, I like renegade intimidated that, Jong guy. Uh, yeah. You had enough renegade to do it. Yeah. I didn't so have like, the options there. So I didn't I didn't kill him. So I had I had the option. Well, anyway, I, I don't know how it all plays out, but like it was basically clearly just like this woman is like, Shepard, you don't have to kill everyone. Just talk to me and I'll I'll set you up with a solution. Mm. So it's like, who wouldn't just be like, okay, is there a way to not kill every like well I, I still think it's I got- Tau later? I don't know. <laughs> in a rush. <laughs> uh, well, I it had, is just faster to shoot them. Facts. <laughs> I had the uh, there's, there's a middle ground here where I had yeah the weight like the equipment to put on my grenade or whatever to modify it so I could turn them back into humans or put them to sleep whatever the hell that was. But I'm very stupid and I started that fight and it's like you only have five grenades and so like you got to yeah. be kind of strategic about where you're placing them. And I'm like, okay, here comes the colonists. Started loading the grenades. Then he realized, oh crap, those weren't the colonists. Those were the creepers, the Thorian creepers. I was shooting that grenade on them, <laughs> oh, not realizing no. that there was a distinction between the way the colonists look and those creepers. And then I was yeah. like, well, now I'm too low on grenades, so yeah. light them up. And then I just like took them all out. But that's like the beauty of Mass Effect is like because I made that one mistake, now like this consequence will ripple throughout three games, which is the fun of the whole thing. Wow. For sure. I, what I didn't know is that you can still just run up and punch them in the face. I wish I, I knew that. that. Yeah, later. I, yeah, I didn't know. Also, dumb question: Where's the melee button? I haven't meleeed yet in this game. Is it what circle? Is it B? Or circle B. B. Really? It's just that? Okay. Yeah. Well, that seems um, complicated. There's also there, there's speaking of I gotta go to Artemis Tau later. Yeah. There's something that I don't think that any of us are going to see because of the order that we're doing things, but the game sort of steers you towards doing Liara, like going to get Liara first. Yeah. But you don't have to. Yeah. You can do Pharos and Novaria, and then Vermeer opens up. So you can go and do Vermeer. Oh, wow. And leave Artemis Tau undone until, like, you can, if you do it, like, last. Yeah. There's different dialogue with 
Liara there as she's trapped because she's essentially been trapped in this like energy <laughs> field, and she's <laughs> she's starting she's starting to lose it a little bit. Like she like she's going a really? little nuts. Yeah, like her di- her dialogue has is in the sphere to, is different. Yeah, the, her dialogue has substantially changed in the sphere when you come find her, and like she doesn't believe you're real. Yeah, Victor Fam wrote in about it. She's like, "You're hallucinations," and she's just batty. Yeah, yeah, I got that oh, for yeah. doing Artemis Tau third of these three. Like, oh, okay. yeah. interesting. I, I thought it had to be after Vermeer. So yeah, I guess if we do it third, then it is different. But. That's funny. Is our yeah. is our yeah. whoops like. F- headcanon version of it where we haven't seen it but we just imagine her being insane a bit much does she does she seem more nuts leo or is she just like yeah i thought you were hallucinations whatever she's completely like i, I mean you, i may as well let you do your thing but i don't have any belief that you're really here <laughs> really oh, saving me yeah oh, interesting uh i would love to hear truly unhinged liara though that would be really fun just yeah back in at the end of mass effect 3 yeah, 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 the end, there she is <laughs> yeah she's a she's my gal and so like encountering her in this yeah. game it, it's kind of like joe was mentioning like kind of the the new game plus for emotions was like well this is my liara yeah. but then like i couldn't tell if her voice was throwing me off because she's like imprisoned and it takes a while for her to warm up or just like liara's cadence of speaking is something i had to like reacquaint myself to but i definitely had that moment of it doesn't feel quite right for my liara but okay i think i think she's basically getting there these characters change so much. Right. Like, I don't feel as, as like, I mean, I know everyone poops on Caden, but like his little <laughs> stories and his voice, he's so, I think he's doing a really nice job of like being sensitive, but grounded and not like a, a push. He's not whiny. And he's like, he's, I don't know. I just, I love his performance. So I actually found it really compelling. And then like, there are characters like Liara and Garrus who I won't really care about until later. Oh, um, Elliot writes in saying, I appreciate this section uh, of the game giving players freedom, but I think it's a mistake not to force you to get Liara first. I understand that after forcing you from planet one to the Citadel, the game wanted to open up instead of continuing down a singular narrative path, but Liara is the most integral member of your party, in my opinion. She has the deepest dialogue tree, her mother is directly connected to Saren, and one of the six main missions, and she helps put into context the events from mission one plus gives context after each subsequent mission once completed i I hear you elliot but i'll always be in favor of freedom like i think it's cool the idea that you could miss liara if you want or do you have to get her at some point you do have to get her she needs to put some pieces together for you that's right my was my impression after doing pharos was that you need her to kind of contextualize a lot of the Okay. Vision. You could just mop, mop up some of these planets like Leo did. Oh, without her. and that, that reminds me, quick correction from last episode when we were talking about the vision being different. Yeah, it was I, the later vision. You were yeah. remembering the later vision. I was I was remembering the like the clarified vision that Liara puts right. together and not that not that first. So one. clarified. <laughs> so clarified. Yeah, it's so, so clear. clear. So crystal. <laughs> it's my new favorite show. So film. so two thousands. <laughs> yeah, I love that idea that Okay, so how does it work? Yeah, okay, so the Thorian, yeah, the Thorian Asari can, like, download all the, clarify the vision for, (laughs) trying to piece this together, for Shepard, and then later Liara's like, hey, give me that vision, and then Liara, like, can mind meld and understand things a little bit better as well. It's like the weird double whammy of Asari blending for the vision stuff. Yeah. I think it's, like, embracing eternity left and right. That is so dumb, right? Embrace eternity? That's very dumb. Wait, what is that? What am I missing? It's what they say every time. Every embrace time, eternity. Every, oh. every time an Asari like does the mind meld, it's like embrace eternity, <laughs> and they open their eyes all dramatic they're and they're black. black, and it's just like, yeah. yeah. I guess it, it feels especially dumb because it happens in rapid success. It's like right, we're one after the other. Yeah, yeah, it happens with the Thorian, and then immediately after that, like ten minutes later, Liara is like, "Hey, let's embrace eternity again." <laughs> Like, come on. Like a talker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're just like, in all these stuff's time, you can figure out how to do it without having to say a, like a punch, yeah. like a punchline or a tagline. Like, you know, like we can, so do you have to yeah. do that? Yeah. Really yeah. It's, it's yeah. Like an anime when people, when characters announce the fighting moves they're doing. Like, yeah. you, you don't need some catchy phrase for everything yeah. you're doing. Just yeah. do but it. But it is cooler. Yeah, I yeah. agree, Joe. Maybe it's uh, like a ritual or like saying grace or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like the, uh, I like the exchange with Liara when you get back to the ship, but it falls into the trap of like, how long have people been interacting with aliens? Like, it's so dopey, but you got to do it in fiction every once in a while. What I'm talking about is when Liara comes back to the ship and she's like, I'm 106 years old. And then Ashley's like, whew, damn, hope I look that good. And it's like, have, are you just learning about this now? Or it's like, 
Ashley, your entire life you should have been aware of Asari and how long they live. But the idea of like having her first reaction when the Aura says it is funky. Um, oh, what's that? Huh? You're blue. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Uh, Harrison trying Holt. to touch her hair. <laughs> like, 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 Ashley, stop it. <laughs> you know what I learned, by the way, that, uh, you know how Liara, I, I, okay, sorry, I'm going to back up. Please. At, at GI, I did a, like an email Q and A with Mac Walters asking a bunch of very specific nerdy questions. And I was asking about like, why do some Asari have eyebrows and some don't? And yeah. Liara very clearly has, like, eyebrows. Mm. And what I learned is that they are not eyebrows, but in fact, like, they're just, like, sort of facial markings that just mm. look suspiciously like eyebrows. For the ones that we need to be a little more expressive. Yeah, yeah. For, right. the, ones that, yeah, for yeah. the ones that you need to think are human, uh, right. they have suspicious eyebrow markings <laughs> rather than actual hairy eyebrows. I yeah. <laughs> don't know what it was about the Legendary Edition and this Asari in particular, but the Asari that comes out of the Thorian's little mm. butthole, uh, that character looked so good. It was like the first time yeah. this game was like, I agree. It, like something about that character, about it, like the sure. green Asari is just like, you're somehow the best looking thing, not not uh, you know, sexually or whatever, but just like visually. It's like this character just looks I awesome. I mean, excuse me, also sexually. <laughs> I mean, yes, also I mean, sexually. She came out of a Thorian butthole. It's voiced by Gwendolyn I mean. Yo, and she's, yeah. I, I wrote that down. I was like, uh, Shiala can get it? Question <laughs> <laughs> Anyway. And if I was, didn't really know who the Asari party member was going to be, and because that character model looked so much better than the regular NPCs, I thought it was going to be her. Oh, wow. funny. Oh, oh interesting. interesting. Cool. Sorry, it's just Liara. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she'll do. I'll take it. <laughs> Little baby Liara. Oh, baby. Um, Innocent Liara. That's right. Uh, Harrison Holt McHale says, I feel like the mining laser in the Prothean ruins on uh, Artemis Tau is very poorly designed. Surely it shouldn't collapse a mine? It's not like Shepard moved where the laser was aiming. They just fired it once. <laughs> well, I mean, they knew when to stop. They had hit like the exact point. They're like, all right, no one touch the laser now because if we touch it again, it'll explode. <laughs> Be cool. Um, you're talking about what a sweetheart Caden is, Sarah. Um, yeah. Ryan Graylish writes in and says, shout out to the Caden Alenko gang. Best dialogue in the section was when he compares the Prothean ruins to the tile floor in a bathroom. <laughs> what? You know, if you have him on your team, he sees the Prothean ruins. He's like, this looks like a bathroom. <laughs> it's like, oh my God, Caden, <laughs> honey, he's a please. Cool guy. I'm trying to fight for you. Honey, just keep your mouth closed. You're embarrassing me in public. <laughs> <laughs> You're so sweet. Just, just, just. <laughs> um, I, He did have a good line. I liked talking to Caden in the ship, though, and he had some line where he said, just talking about, uh, you know, the history of humanity in space, and he said, we finally get to the final frontier, and it's already settled, and the residents don't seem impressed by the view or dangers. It's like, that's a, that's a cool he summary. he actually has a at. really measured... Like, if Ashley is like, aliens are mad, like, Caden is, has like, you know, he's had, he's had plenty of experiences with the aliens that aren't positive, and he maintains a pretty, like, you know, open-minded and, and balanced perspective around the whole thing. He's like, people, you know, what the thing about everybody is we all, we're all a mixed bag, <laughs> you know? And so, like, it's very grounding to talk to him and check in with him after these missions, because he always has kind of, like, a, a car, like a thoughtful approach to stuff. Yeah, he doesn't look down on the other races, but he also snapped an alien's freaking neck who was his teacher. It wasn't because he was an alien, it was because he was being I know, girlfriend. but that detail is just, it's so jarring about just like, oh yeah, and then I had to snap my teacher's neck. All right, moving on. Trying to. Another thing about Caden gunner. is everyone's like, he's so soft. And you're like, he's a really dangerous biotic. Yeah. Excuse me. It's insane. <laughs> the most paragon guy. That's a good, that's a good call. Yeah, this is why he <laughs> keeps his stuff together now. He breaks arms, or he breaks necks, but then he goes and cries in the bathroom still yeah. in the <laughs> tile for hours afterwards. Yeah. yeah. And looks at his meter. <laughs> oh no, my paragon's gone down. <laughs> oh. uh, I like him alone. I, you're right. I liked his little backstory too about like, was it Jump yeah. Zero, that's the name of that research station, but it's such a fun idea of like, oh yeah, we had that on the far edge of our solar system because we we're like researching yeah. faster than light travel. And then we found the mass relay and we're like, all right, forget that freak station that we had built way out there. We don't need that no more. Fun he's also like stuff. the first, he's an early generation of biotics, right? So it's like, I mean, he, I'm just going through whatever these changes are, all his little migraines and just like, and and companies taking advantage and, and experimenting on people. I mean, I don't know. I think he's moderately interesting. 
Yeah. I'm liking him. I'm liking him better this playthrough than I than I have before. I mean, I mm. as painful as it is for me to admit that because I will always joke about how lame and boring he is. Um, uh. I think that there is there's I, I I find myself wishing that those later innovations that came in other Bioware games were present here, partially because I do wish that it, that his story could be like fleshed out a little bit more. I think that of all the characters, he probably is the, he has the fewest ways to engage in dialogue. Hmm. I feel like he, he was the one that the, the soonest just sort of resorted to stock responses. He didn't have any special quests. He didn't have any special quests for me to go on. It's like, after he told me that story about snapping that guy's neck, it was just like, Hey, what's going on? Hey, we're all in it. Commander. We're good. Thanks. Yeah. And then, huh. that, then that's it. You know, I kind of, I kind of wish I could, get to know him a little better, but it seems like that door is closed. Yeah. That's interesting. I wonder if like, is that just, I wonder if that's the same. Cause I mean, normally what Bioware does, which is so clever is that you will have the same amount of runway or like, a, a, you know, it'll, it's just friendship inflected or romance inflected with some, obviously some bonus scenes and other stuff for, for romance. But like, is that is it true? Like, because I don't, I haven't felt that yet. We haven't run out of things to, we haven't run out of things to say to each other. So um, <laughs> I don't know, like if, I if we're at the same point and I'm about to go to into to a phase where he's still like giggity giggity but like no more nothing to say <laughs> or yeah. if or if I will have more because we're we've triggered a romance I don't know because yeah. I haven't hit that point yet where he's like no more no no more chit chat bye yeah hmm. well, I forget next episode because they're usually really good about that making sure that you always mm. that even if you're just friends there's content you know you're chatting mm. yeah Ben did anyone write in or uh, leave a comment on Patreon about Saren? In this section, hmm. oh, I guess not. Let me control F Saren. Um, people talked about <laughs> they like. Um, I'd like to control F Saren. Sorry. Excuse me, <laughs> ma'am. Good <laughs> lord. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think people wrote in about um his ship, um, and like it, it's interesting that it has like that indoctrination built into it. Um, but not much beyond yeah. that. Mm. Though, that. That's part of what that's part of the point I wanted to make, I guess, is that like I think it's really funny that Saren is really present and is your villain in those first like six or seven hours. You right. See, like you see him, you talk about him, and at this point, he almost like for this section of the game, he almost reminds me of Sephiroth in Final Fantasy VII mm. because he's referenced, but he just isn't present. Yeah. You do not see Saren at all for I mean for me. I spent seven hours playing for the first discussion and 30 hours playing for this discussion. Oh, wow. So it's like, I am 37 hours into the game and I have not seen the primary antagonist for 30 of those hours. But it almost wow. builds up his lore more because you're just like, oh, he's hot on the heels and trying to talk yeah. to these characters who have some connection to Saren. I guess like, you know, even stuff like Rex, I thought that was really interesting that he told his backstory about working with Saren mm -hmm. just to help build up that lore of, I knew he was bad news, Shepard. All that fun yeah. stuff. I definitely feel that pressure of the frustration of like, ah, I'm just one step behind him every every step of the way. Or, yeah. You know. yeah. Um, he already got to the cool old creatures before I did. Um, it I was like me that killed them. <laughs> <laughs> the bad guy. Yeah. yeah. I like, I, he's the bad guy. <laughs> I like talking to the Asari um, that gets spat out by the Thorian as well. Because there's like a line where she says everything. She's the one who tells you about Sovereign and all that stuff. Um and then Shepard can ask, like, hey, what about you, then, Shiala? What, what are you all about? And she really is just like, eh, nothing. I just follow Benezia. She's like, writes off her entire history. Like, I, I'm not important. Please don't pay attention to me. Really just focus on Saren, please. <laughs> like a weird move for her writing, but it works. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see. Shimmy Neutron writes in and says, the Thorian is disgusting inside and out. Poop puking clones are gross. Well... That's true, but he knows so much. It's cool well, that he's... that's subjective. Yeah, <laughs> he's been around for so long. I gotta give it up. Um, let's see. Uh, Nick Wright completely forgot about the Thorian since the first time he played. Um, has anybody had a moment of that, of just completely it forgetting was. what was in this game? I forgot the Thorian's name. Yeah, All right, too. okay. I forgot the name. But... For sure. I, I definitely have forgotten a lot of stuff. I mean, the Thorian is definitely that moment of like, I forget what the mystery is about these colonies. And it's like, oh, that's right. Big ancient tree thing. Got it. Got yeah, it. I remembered plant possession, but I did not remember the name. And I didn't remember what it looked like, actually. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. Speaking of how it looks, uh, downtown. I remembered Shiela, actually. <laughs> really? Well, she's unforgettable. <laughs> 
Uh, downtown San Francisco on a Patreon saying, anyone notice how much darker the Pharaoh's colony seems in the legendary edition compared to the original? I think it was the only visual update I wasn't thrilled with. I guess I didn't notice that. I'm not doing too many side-by-side comparisons and stuff, but... um, Let's see, do you want some dorky stuff about Pharaoh's? Yeah. Uh, Lachlan Belford writes in, says, there are actually several factors that determine if the colony survives or not. You need 13 quote-unquote viability points to save the colony. Each colonist you save is worth one point. Each side quest you did, food, water, power, is worth one point. Sparing Shiala is worth five points. And if you manage to convince Ethan Jiang to help, which takes 12 charm or 10 intimidate, he is worth 12 points. So even a renegade shepherd who kills all the colonists can still save the colony by convincing Zhang to and doing a single side quest. Uh, it's fascinating. I do love that little nerdy number crunching. Love it. I love the stuff under the hood. You did? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Gotta do it. You can't trust her. She's too beautiful to live. We but you agree. can trust the Rachni Queen? <laughs> <laughs> Ow. Yes. <laughs> uh, Cade Gronlin. <laughs> okay. Going back to Artemis Tau, Cade Gronlin writes in and says, the Paragon line to Joker to be evacuated from Therum is, quote, on the double, mister. It sounds super out of place compared to basically every other line of dialogue in the game, especially when dealing with other Alliance personnel. Well, that's true. Everything's got to be, everything's got to pop in. It's like a 1930s mob movie. Yeah. It's like what you say to your son who's dawdling when you're trying to get him (laughs) out the door to the bus. Yeah. I liked, um, there's a line when you wrap up Novaria, when Joker calls you over the intercom. Maybe it's even when you're back in the Normandy, I forget. But like he sounds really tired and I love it. Oh, I love just a little performance from Seth Green about just like at this point in the mission, he is just fried. Mm. And I, it could be seen as maybe he was tired in the in the voice booth. But I, I would choose to imagine Use that it's it. like <laughs> his character just being exhausted with this mission because he's been flying the Normandy for so long now. I think he's fantastic. I think he's really good. And I keep, well, if anything, I'm actually surprised. Something I did forget was just how little there is to chat with him about until mm. subsequent titles. Right. I keep going up and being like, what's up, Joker? And he'll be like, you hear my bones? I'm like, I know about your bones. I'm like, Never mind, I'm out. Like, <laughs> you know? So we just talked about this. We talked about this minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you don't know? No, actually, I do. Oh, my God. Back up. <laughs> yeah. Sean Mills writes in saying, I especially enjoyed Joker's backstory and the reveal that he has a rare condition called Vralic Syndrome that makes it so his bone structure is hollow and brittle. There's something interesting yeah. about the idea of an ace pilot who can't physically move his legs of course my renegade shepherd immediately warned him not to infect the rest of the crew when he had confessed his condition to me <laughs> that's such a dick move <laughs> don't let your stupid legs infect us all right carry on soldier good god, <laughs> good god. Well, also like i think maybe i've been I, I had bleed over from battlestar galactica just knowing the g's that that pilots are subjected to and so i think it's because talking to joker i'm like wow how are you doing this like <laughs> what <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, do you think um, so? On the Ringers podcast, rewatchables about like old movies. They have a segment called Apex Mountain, where they debate like what was at its peak when this was released, which actor, which concept. And I was thinking a lot about it. Is this Seth Green Apex Mountain, like 2007, a cool kind of understated, good human role? Is this top Seth Green? So is the apex of. Is his, this like his career. Seth Green at the height of his of, yes. of his popularity, or is this Seth Green like the best of Seth Green we ever got? Of I his think talent? height of popularity. Oh no, pro- he was in no. he was in Buffy before that, right? Well, in mm-hmm. Austin Powers, in but, and yeah. Austin Powers. So it's right when Austin Powers one releases. That's Apex Mountain for Seth Green. I think this is this is Apex Mountain to me because I love him the I love his performance the most of the performances of yes. his that I have seen. So that's my. Feeling. You'll take I it. feel like I, I feel like he's walking down the other side of Apex Mountain by the time 2007 comes along. Not like and again, oh, yeah, no, no insult to I Seth Green. I, I, I think he does. I think he's doing a good job. But I, I feel like if you're talking about Apex, yeah. Well, what about is, Robot Chicken though? Because seriously though, like that because Robot Chicken was huge for a while, and he's great on it, and he's a huge force behind it. So like, mm. it's probably still on the air for all I know. <laughs> I think it is. Is it really? It might be. Oh my god! It might well be. That'd be amazing. So find out. But but I mean, but that era, I'd have to have to go back and look, like when when I was watching lots of Robot Chicken. <laughs> but um, mm. yeah. I feel like I I feel like it was before Mass Effect came out that you could let's say just walk up to a stranger on the street and say like, "Do you know who Seth Green is?" Oh. We have had the, the Gen Z test and have yeah. the answer be yes. I think that's prior to Mass Effect. Okay, could be huh. right. Wow, uh, Rat Race. 
Scooby Doo Two. <laughs> adventure. Can't hardly wait. Oh, that's that's, that's, that's can't the, hardly that's, wait. That's oh, you know what? Can't hardly wait is a that's in the running. But that's but that's also like that's, that's pre peak. That's, that's pre way earlier. Pre-peak. Way earlier. Hey, yeah. Justin also McKinney. Super underrated movie. There it is. Fantastic. Justin McKinney submits a comment over on Patreon though and says, "Please stop talking about Seth Green." No, uh, he says the Port Hanshin section of Navaria. <laughs> <laughs> the Port Hanshin section of Navaria is a real standout to me. It's unlike anything else in the rest of the series in that you can accomplish your goal of leaving the port in a lot of different ways. Most people will probably work with Lorik. Quinn to get the garage pass, mm-hmm. but you can also convince him to testify against an Anolius. An, How do you pronounce that one again? Anolius. Thank you. Anolius with G- mm-hmm. Gianna Parasini. Gianna Parasini. Thank you, expert. Uh, or you can just give the evidence to Anolius and get the pass and some credits. Uh, you can even skip all of this by telling Anolius about the Hanar merchant. Uphold, who asks you in a side quest to smuggle something in. Right. There's a lot to unpack in this whole Port Hanshin. Uh, Leo, what did you think of Novaria, the Snow Corporation planet? It was another planet that I really loved the vibe once I landed there and wish I kind of got to explore more, but I did enjoy exploring the kind of like plaza, taking the elevators to the different regions and getting a feel for what that place was like. I felt like it was the best like world building of a of a place that isn't exactly besieged. You know, this is like a place where people go to exist in Mass Effect. Yeah. And they, I they, love Analeas. I loved hating Analeas. I think he's great. His his lack of time for you is seething. It's like just a that's the word I'm scarring. Very <laughs> hateable. You're fantastic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And mm. he's so much like the other guy on Ferris where he's like, everything, this entire world is private property now. So yeah. be cool, dude. Yeah. I, I feel like every planet needs to have one of those guys. Basically, I mean, you've got you've got Udina on the Citadel. Uh, right. You've got Jong on Ferris and you have Analeas on Novaria. Right. That that character who's just designed for you to be like, I'm going to shoot that guy. Yep. Yeah. The punchable creature yeah. or person yeah. yeah in the world every planet needs it yeah also he's like he's like i'm gonna ch- i'm gonna charge you for however much like for the time like i've, I've seen i received 1500 emails and so like you're on company time now <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so good. Like, <laughs> and i love just like a lot of little design things on novaria like i like the little flying gun turrets they're just so cute it looks like they should have bo- like bobbly googly eyes on them or something with like rah, 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 doing their little squirmy move around it's fun um Chris H. writes in and says, Hey, how is Lorik aware of the phrase the fly in the lotion? Do Turians moisturize? Lorik's the one who gets you in the garage on Navaria, says Chris. Yeah, oh, he's yeah. just a very smart guy. It yeah, it's a nice reminder that Turians listen and pick up human phrases. But he But he gets it wrong. That's the joke. He does? Yeah, it's a fly in the ointment. Oh, that's why it wasn't that. Like, what is it? The fly in the well, lotion? And you're like, oh, close. Okay. Close enough. <clears throat> there's there's also the fact that I don't think that all these characters are necessarily speaking like the, a galactic sim, galactic standard language. I think that they, I don't remember if it's in this game that they go into it. I may have missed the codex, but it's like the idea is that your Omni tool sort of has an instantaneous mm. alien translation function. So that mm. could also be a, a, you know, a, a, a weird Google translate moment of an idiom not going through properly. Yeah. I think, I he, think he tried to do the thing and he came really close. And right it's points for effort. I mean, there's. I think um, Shepard at one point does say when someone's speaking science or something. I think it was on Pharos, which is like care to translate that into galactic. Right. So there is. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if that's just for humans though. Um, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I'm sure there's a, there's a codex in there somewhere about it. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, Novaria. Ryan Fosheed writes in and says, "Hello, fellow specters." Did any of you take a moment to talk to the Turian mechanic, Lee, standing in front of the garage in Avaria? Something about this random NPC's overall laid-back vibe really resonated with me on this playthrough. Up to that point in Avaria, it had been cold or manipulative towards Shepard. Enter this friendly Turian who's obviously just out of his element. I think this is something that Golden Age Bioware truly excelled at, filling the worlds with unnecessary but interesting characters whose only real purpose is to make the environments feel more alive. He just like gave context or something. Like I really wish that he had been involved in some mission or something. He's got like a slight Brooklyn vibe going. Yeah, like a, it's like a Brooklyn Turian mechanic <laughs> dude. And I was like, yes, they're great. It's like you need a break on that planet from everybody just being yeah. an uptight corporate person. Yeah, he's the perfect laid back dude by the garage over there. Sounds like Glenn Schofield, the developer. It's just perfect. <laughs> um, do you like Navaria, Joe? Yeah. In fact, you know, you're talking about talking to Laura Queen or whatever his name yeah. is. Uh, that is where I use the exploit to maximize my renegade points. Because you can you can continually 
Um, there's a way that you can repeat the dialogue chain yeah. in which you convince him to testify uh, right. when you have the evidence. Okay. And you can just and you can just stack on the uh, the paragon and renegade points for it. I should have so, still gonna testify. Oh yeah, yeah. Still gonna testify. Same outcome. You just get into the. It's like me talking to Joker about his bones. Like you can just keep doing it and recycling <laughs> the path. So if you have, so if in it are is Paragon and Renegade, then and he sits there, you just can keep doing it. I, I forgot about that. I didn't know that. I forgot. That's I should have done it. I'm very quickly because I, I I did not have enough of either to do anything with John persuasively, and so I, I may start to hit points where I don't have enough. I have like more charm than intimidate. But I have a handful of each, but I'm not yeah. maxed out. So. I think that's how I was able to get, like, to raise my intimidate cap high enough that, that I could do the jong, the jong thing when it came right. up. Was that uh, I had spent some time doing that. I also thank you to the uh, to the commenter who mentioned the money exploit. Oh no, uh, because I used that also and got got myself a lot of a lot of sets of uh, savant amps and uh, colossus armor. I am fully wow. Fully decked out as a squad. Well, you're playing so. this game so well, Joe. It's like you don't even have to play the game. Congratulations. <laughs> you're really you're really doing it. <laughs> Anything I can do to minimize interaction with the game. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> that's what I'm doing. No, I thought uh, on, on the on the point of Novaria, though, I, I guess that's I get still kind of get Citadel vibes from it in the way that the, the very. Uh, to use Leo's phrase from the last one, there is an Xbox 360 amount of people milling about in that open plaza, right? right. And it's like, mm. you know, it's it's funny to think that this game came out in the same year that Assassin's Creed did, that has those big milling crowds that you push your way through and stuff. And in this game, you, you know, like you try and get a sense of this being a place that people go to and live in and work in and whatever. But at the same time, you've got like a, a smattering of people here and there who are just standing in the ex exact same spot doing nothing in particular, you know? Yeah. Is there any, there's that, like, the way that the Novaria Plaza kind of dips and there's, there's a couple levels, like, I feel like running through there, I had memories of, like, talking to people and doing stuff in there, but this time around I did not, I mean, did anyone have any conversations at all with anybody on that level? Not really, I don't no, think. I didn't miss anything, I, mean, I just made up the, some memories, I guess. Yeah, just like the <laughs> undercover person yeah, you talk to in that area later on and stuff. But yeah, I don't remember yeah. anything too huge. Uh, mm -hmm. Tommen.gif writes in and said, did anyone else get offended that the Hanar on Neveria only offers you 250 credits to smuggle something for them? Even Absolutely. Though I just, even though I just bought a gun for 400,000? I did. It's I did and I was mean about it. I, I was a... Uh, and then he gave me more. You know, I'm annoyed by all these criminal corporate crooks on Neveria and stuff. So the second that Hanar was trying to pull that crap about smuggling, I'm like, and it shut him down immediately and immediately went and told the boss about it. Like, yeah, this Hanar is bad you news. Narc. Yeah, but it's like, this. Guy, I, it's, I'm trying to shut off. down yes. illegal stuff. And if this Hanar immediately is like, hey, I've got some illegal stuff here. It's like, all right, well, I need to stick by my code. You're not getting by just because you're a cute, weird Hanar. I was like, he's a, you know, he's a struggling business business owner. He He's made this deal and he's probably going to get killed by this Krogan warlord <laughs> if he can't deliver. So that's why I did it. Yeah, helped him out. I I, what I don't know is if you can go talk to Inamorta before resolving that quest. Because he's up, he's upstairs in the bar. And then he just he's just really surly. And I was like, did I miss content where I could go talk to him about the purchase or what he's gonna do with it or anything? Like maybe I Yeah, I'm I, I got that know? same sense. I'm I don't remember, but I'm it would be weird if you couldn't talk to him. I don't know. Did either of mm -hmm. you guys go talk to that the Krogan in the bar? No, area I didn't go talk to him. He's on the second level of the bar. Okay. So what I did is I talked to Opal, and then I was like, "All right, I'll go get your thing." And then I went back out to my to the Normandy, and I got it, and I brought it back, and I mm, tied it up. But if I had gone to the bar first, maybe I could have talked to Inamorta and been like, "So are you a terrible person? Did I not give you highly experimental <laughs> weapons mods?" <laughs> right. Or you right. Know. You're like, "Hey, I'll give you a discount." Or right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. E and T Clark writes in and says, "On Novaria, after ratting out the merchant Opal to Admin Analeas, I ran back to the spot where the Hanar was selling the goods to see what would happen." I let Opal know what I did, and his response was something like, this will make this one's life here very difficult. My shepherd's response was basically, that's how it goes. <laughs> Opal then asked me to leave, but the game gave me some option to ask if I could still buy something. The Hanar's response made me chuckle. He sighs before saying, very well. <laughs> and you can keep buying from him like nothing happened. <laughs> that's so sad. <laughs> Opal. Uh, can you just Aaron, oh, keep... Speaking of buying things... 
this is th- this is something that like I found very frustrating about the way the game works just on like a mechanical level is the way that the shops replenish yeah like i had to go and like mm. I, I did i had to do research online to figure out like okay wait a minute what are the mechanic like what determines what items are available where and when mm. because there are times when it's like you want a specific thing in in my case like there's a set of armor that's called co- the colossus armor which is my favorite and but it's like whether or not you get it and who you get it for is feels so random. It's like mm. like maybe the guy on the Normandy is selling it, but he's selling heavy Colossus armor. So yeah. it's like, ugh, I guess I have to give that to Ashley instead of wearing it myself. I want my Colossus armor, you know? So mm-hmm. I had to do a bunch of digging around to remind myself how it works. And it's a really annoying system that you basically like – if. The, the short version is like, if you want to get something specific, you need to save before you talk to a merchant. Mm-hmm. And if they don't have what you want, reload. Save scum. And talk, yeah, I mean, you, you save scum it, but it's like the, the trick is, is that you have to do it when they're generating new inventory. Uh-huh. So it's like, if you've already talked to a merchant and nothing special has happened, it's just going to be the same inventory. It only changes when you like level up. Oh, so then you talk to, so if you level up and then go back to the merchant, then it'll refresh it. So then that's when you save it. But then the mer- the merchants will also have like the one on the Normandy has a different static inventory based on mm-hmm. whether or not he's at Novaria, Pharos, yeah. the Citadel. Because the theory it's, said he's he's in, getting inventory from where you're visiting. Yeah. So I don't need. I mean, that's already too deep and boring. But is this it, how you it, spent thirty hours in the? In the yeah, no yes. kidding. My it's God, doing. I spent a lot of time saving and reloading and going between merchants and selling and re- <laughs> rebuying items. But wow. um. hey, each their own. Uh, Aaron T submits a comment on Patreon saying, "Hey, Normandy Maxers, that's it. You got us. Um, why does a shepherd, a specter?" <laughs> who can go anywhere, do anything, or shoot anyone who gets in the way, go through all the trouble of getting involved with shady locals to obtain a garage pass, when the Normandy could just fly right over the building and drop the Mako directly onto the road outside of the garage. Hell, why not just drop the Mako on the front door of the Peak 15 facility? Come on, Shepard, act like a dang specter! Mm-hmm. Well, come on. You know, game, it's, you always need like a cute little garage to land the Normandy, right? It's a very specific thing. They can't just off-road it. Well, Can't except- they? Except you constantly, anytime you land on an uncharted world, you see the yeah. Normandy like pooping out the Mako yeah. from at, like from <laughs> mid atmosphere. Yeah. yeah, yeah, you really could. It's a great point. Yeah. Uh, but then we wouldn't meet our lovely garage man. That's from right, Brooklyn. and that makes it all worth it. it life is <laughs> yeah. about those happy accidents. Yeah. Uh, Nick Olson writes in and says, "Hey gang, I'm loving replaying the game so far, but the memory core puzzle in Novaria brought back so many bad memories." Not only does the game not tell you the rules of the minigame, but the cacophonous blaring of trumpets when you solve it is sure to leave you scarred for life. <laughs> uh, I saw that crap immediately. I'm like, uh, what's this? I can pay 100 Omni Gel to get out of it? Done. I, any any way to bypass a puzzle, I'm all in for. It's a common <laughs> puzzle, though. I mean, it's a it's a that's a classic. That one, the little it, stackies. A, I just did it in Carto again, huh? It's Tower of Hanoi. Is that is that what it's, is that what it's called? called? I think so. Yeah. Just because it's classic doesn't mean it's fun. Like, is anybody You're right? No, no. <laughs> just you, you know. But I mean, that also that that also taps into another thing though, where it's like the idea. I, okay, so I can pay Omnigel to not do a puzzle, but I can also pay Omnigel to just open treasure chests and stuff all over the place. Like, how does it not raise a flag? That like, boy. Doing this mini game sure is annoying. We need to give players a way to bypass it, but we should also probably limit their ability to do that. Is like, there are a few things like that that as I'm playing the the legendary edition, I guess I wonder why. I'm not saying I expected Bioware to go all out and like remake the whole thing or rebuild it or whatever, but it's yeah, like, why keep those dumb mini games in there? The hacking, the pressing the button and sequence, yeah. like the first yeah. episode of this deepest dive, it felt like a nitpick, but now I've spent. St- so much time doing it that I officially have a problem with it. I've it's like done Simon says like twice, like the 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 witch button order, and then remember yeah, twice you on every box I see. I've been do, just doing this little super hexagony thingy. 
Oh, it's different mini games. What's what? happening? That super hexagony thing. I don't even know what that well, is. Well, you know, there's like there's like rings, and then yeah. there's like little obstacles that are circling around it in different directions, and you have to navigate, or like Frogger or something. You have to navigate your cursor to the center. What are you talking no one else about? Have Am I that the wrong game? It's Mass Effect One, Sarah. Yeah. <laughs> Does that have to do with yeah. class or something? What? Does yeah. that have to do with the class Maybe? you are or something? Is it, That's so or weird. is it? Because like I, it shouldn't just be a difference between electronics and decryption, right? It should just be. Oh, maybe it's something with that. that? I have no, no idea. It, every time, every time I need to open something that's locked, whether it's like salvaging a probe, recovering some wreckage, or opening a weapons locker, it's always that Simon Says game for me. I, and, what is happening? What weird. is this difference? Somebody in the comments will will let you know. That's really interesting. Please, yeah. Um, Chris Prohaska. Asked, did anyone else think it was weird when you have the option to agree to not be let out of that containment zone in Ovaria when you go to make the cure if you come back with an anomaly? I know it never actually happened, but it's odd that the game's good dialogue choice in that scenario could have led to Shepard condemning themselves and his team to just rot away in that cell forever. Well, yeah. <laughs> Say that one more time. What is it? So there is the containment zone in Ovaria, and it's like, I'm so confident that I can go cure those people that you can lock me in there if there's any anomaly oh, right. with this virus or whatever mm, it is. Right. And so, yeah, Chris is saying that that's a bold move for somebody on a quest to save the galaxy. It could have been lying. Yeah. Oh, Shepard would have busted out of that immediately. He's like, yeah. what? I'm infected? <laughs> Get me out of here! Yeah. Just goes okay. running through the streets of Nevaria. <laughs> uh, by the way, in that well, area... a promise is a promise, he says, and sits down on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> Loaded to the gills with weapons and explosives. <laughs> I, Anybody know any word games? <laughs> <laughs> you ever tried Simon Says? It's pretty sweet. <laughs> uh, I love in this Great section. Great way for the one-year-olds to learn memory development. <laughs> <laughs> you should do it a lot. <laughs> I love in this section there is a Volus. The Volus, speaking of yeah. alien performances, are always secret settled. juggernauts, but this guy named Han Olar, the Volus, is like one of my favorite characters in the game so far, where everybody just talks about how like he lost his mind and he is not sane anymore. And he just talks in this very sad voice. And he's like, I'm sane, Shepard. God, am I sane? <laughs> and then he like tells that story about like when everything went to hell, there was a doctor and he like rushed to get out yeah. of this area and like sealed the door and the doctor ended up dying and, and the backstory there but just a weird tragic figure that again is he's ah, great goodbye worst and he's that, he has that line where you're like ah it wasn't your fault and you're just like and he's like you think i want absolution there is none right it's just so like heavy and it's great yeah he's very good yeah um i also liked the asari that you meet who's like meditating in that area you're coming over through. it just the most over it sorry yeah but i like that idea of like yeah i like rpgs where some characters are just like who are you i, I don't want to talk to you right now you know like real life when you try and talk to people on the street and they say please sir i'm not interested in communicating but then that asari comes back to you and is yeah. actually secretly evil and it's like oh, i wish i wish she was just a good asari that was more interested in meditating than talking to some random human running by but, both mean but with a really robust meditation practice yeah. yes mm -hmm. exactly i'm meditating <laughs> on how to get more evil yeah I mean, that's also part of the way the vocabulary of the game works, though, right? Is like if there's anyone that you can talk to, actually like engage with in conversation, that's kind of the game's way of signaling to you like this is a person that you could, should be paying attention to. Yes. Right? Yeah. Like, yeah. If you could have an in-depth conversation with every nobody who's just meditating, and this game would take so much longer to, to get. It'd take like 30 hours to get Is that my version of free roaming in space? Like, it's my version of landing on planets, being able to talk about absolutely nothing with every single NPC? <laughs> I don't yeah. know. This is the game. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, all of Novaria, maybe I just wasn't in the best lore mood or something, but I feel like it does a much worse job introducing you to what's going on outside of like the politics of the little area and stuff. I think that's fine. But once you get actually into like the systems and all your dialogue prompts, are just about like, let me tell you about the piping and hot labs. Like I, I, I just there's not enough like of a character focused for a lot of this section. It's just a lot of systems talk about the systems of Peak Fifteen that didn't really yeah. grab me. I don't know, Leo, if it struck you as as a compelling section. Uh, not especially. I was kind of making my way through it very briskly. It was kind of combat heavy as a lot of these sections were for me. It's it's weird how little we talk about the combat for how it's kind of 60% of what we did, right? No, we'll keep glossing past that. It's a good game. It's a good game, Leo. Don't worry, we'll keep going. Uh, yeah, well, what'd you think of it? 
The combat? Yeah. You know, it's a, it's a kind of eat lead return of Mad Hazard type <laughs> combat. <laughs> <laughs> the powers, I, it's, you know, you want the powers to be interesting interactions, right? Which sounds like that's what 2 does great, and I'm really excited to get to that. But this, it's very, like, you kind of do the one gimmicky thing your class can do, and it gets very repetitive very quickly. You can't do that much with a tool set, it seems to me. Yeah, I'm just loading up on sniping. Just snipers and yeah. pistols, and I, I love the pistol-wielding shepherd, but it is a little, a little rote. I will say that my favorite, I have refound one of my favorite things about Mass Effect, a Mass Effect, and like, a, <laughs> and it is Garrus specific, but, and it really builds later. But like, one of my favorite sort of embodied character relationships is the feeling of, of Garrus sniping from behind you, like taking someone out that you need in the right moment. And like, especially because I'm, I, because I'm a Sentinel, so I have a couple things. So I have like Lift and, or, or if Layara's Le got Singularity and just like, giving him cryo am ammo and having him like li like lift and then knowing that Gar and then having Garrus like just set him up knock him down it feels really good that's pretty fun oh yeah but yeah you're right Leo I mean it is telling that out of hundreds and hundreds of comments we got two about combat like really <laughs> <laughs> but you're right when it's the majority of kind of what we're doing here it is it is certainly telling it's like I just want games you know the easiest difficulty should be story difficulty and that should change the number of combat encounters, not just the health everyone has. Mm -hmm. That's what I was thinking playing through this. Because I did put it down to the easiest just because I want to, you know, uh, it's not what I'm here for. And when I'm challenged by it, it's not, you know, especially exciting still. So I'm just like, I don't want it to hurt my impression of this game because I'm getting too bogged down in the thing I'm not here to do. But I do wish it, you could just like skip some of those basic encounters that don't really add much for me. Yeah, I, I've actually found this experience to be easier than I remembered it. I don't know if I'm just doing more yeah. content, so more leveled up, or if they tweak something with legendary, but or maybe in the final third it'll get a lot more challenging. But I remember a lot of hearing Saren's theme again and again uh, the mm. first time I played this game back in the day. That's a good point. Um, Joe's squinting like. Oh no no! I'm I, I'm just thinking about that. It's like my my big memories of that hearing that theme over and over again are like playing on insanity. Did you ever mm. do you ever do that? No no. Okay. No, I just like bad. In order to get all the in order to get all the achievement points in the original one, you had to you had to beat the game on insanity. So there was like the at that point, it really like the weaknesses in the combat shine through much stronger than right. the strengths. Right. And sure. uh, I got very frustrated with it. And I'm happy to see that in this one, uh, they've removed the trophy now is just like beat mass effect one on any difficulty and it doesn't matter which one and you can get the platinum for mass effect one but i think that there's also a sort of like collection wide trophy set that applies to all three games mm. and that involves beating them on insanity but, oh. uh mm. dumb question for you joe i'm googling it as i'm asking you did they ever add damage numbers in a drama did they have damage numbers it feels like this type of game where i would actually appreciate some numbers That's popping off. Oh, I don't remember ever seeing damage numbers. I guess it may it maybe was an option, but I don't know that I've ever I am if so, I've never turned them on. Yeah, it doesn't but seem like it is. That but they walked back on a little bit. Was that Sarah? There was there was uh, people were loud about the damage numbers on the anthem. Oh first. really? Did uh, they get rid uh, of them uh, right. in Anthem? Yeah. Huh? Did they get rid of them in Anthem or make it an option? They certainly toned them down. Okay. Hmm. They did That's, address it. That's weird. That feels like a certain era. Are we just past that now? Where is anybody still annoyed by damage numbers? I don't know. I mean, I think what's annoying about damage numbers, for for me anyway, is that like you don't, they don't really. They're supposed to quantify something, but you don't feel it, right? Like you don't feel stronger. You just see that you're doing a hundred damage instead of fifty damage or something. So at that point, it's just sort of visual noise. Mm. I don't know. I mean, I, you just, I think that every game that wants them just has to have the option to turn them off. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. that's fair. Uh, Isaac mm -hmm. Sinova writes in and says, trying to fight multiple Krogan at the same time uh, can be the most frustrating thing on the harder difficulty levels. They hit like a truck and they survive my sniper mm -hmm. rifle shots. How rude. Yeah, I got this is why you need throw, honey. <laughs> you need stasis. You need singularity. You yeah. need to be a bastion. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is fun. Lift. I, I love having like just such a clear silhouette of like, okay, Krogan coming at you. It's going to be a problem. Especially I think in an Artemis Tau where like 
It might be the first one you fight, where he has that whole cutscene of him like stomping up, and it's like a super low angle angle of him coming in. They're pretty cool. Uh, let's see. Oh, Doreen Clyer writes in and says, courtesy of Nick from Atlanta. I don't know how this works, Doreen. You're relaying something? Talk about a mass relay. Anyways, did anyone bring Liara to the confrontation with Matriarch Benezia? I did just because I love having Liara with me. She's also my love interest in the game uh, and forgot that she'd be seeing her mother die in front of her. Regardless, I thought the conversation at the ship after Neveria was done uh, really well and showed maturity and depth on Liara's part. Yeah, I did bring Liara uh, to the Benezia fight, and I think I was always expecting a little bit more. Like, they talk a little bit, but I think it's just, who knows about the way this thing was actually constructed, but I wanted them to, like, embrace or have some physical interaction or something, but it's still just kind of Liara standing behind you being like, I don't know about that, mother. That's about it. Not here to go easy on you, mom. Right. <laughs> okay. I mean, she 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 calls her by a pet name as she croaks. Yeah, what is it? It's um little, little wing. wing. Yeah, I think that's a really nice moment in there of like, oh, no context for that, but that just implies yeah. a, some backstory. History. Yeah, that whole fight I think is um j- narratively or just sort of characterization, like dialogue wise, is, is a little rough. To I me. it feels like a middle school theater performance. Like I don't know, I can't even track what's happening at times. You know, where it's like, <sighs> Joe, you seem like you're with me. She she has she or just her death I guess is like yes it, when you, when you said middle school theater production is like that's what it feels like to me It's like when a character needs to die and in, in a in a badly done play it's always like remember you are my little wing <sighs> but it's not even that it's it's worse than that because she goes remember you are my little wing no light. They always said yeah. there'd be a light at the end of yeah. the <laughs> oh that, yeah they always said there'd be light. it's just like yeah. oh. <laughs> That yeah. didn't, like that the lame death coupled with the lack of payoff of having Liara there, which you feel mm-hmm. like you bring her along because you want to hear that in you want you're like you the game has told you that this is going to pay off, and it just sort of like peters out also i yeah. I'm just confused, and I think it helps it feel kind of rushed and, and just weird, but I'm confused just about like. First of all, what she was doing during the fight, she just like had that shield up, and I was confused about even how she died. It's like it wasn't like a big fight against her. It seemed like it was just kind of like one shot, and then I was like, oh wait, a cutscene starting and she's dying. Everything just felt confusing in that whole it's sequence. It's like she's either expending energy summoning people or like creating them whole cloth. Like, but you don't see people kind of run in. But I'm like, why are you so tired? Like, what you know? And then she just gets more. It's, it's like a, a mess. it's a Luke Skywalker death in some ways. It's a little a little confusing, um, but yeah, the, the downside of having Liara in on this fight is I am a, not a smart person, but I'm not ashamed to admit that I spent eh, 15 seconds just unloading in Liara because <laughs> when the sorry squad of commandos is in the room, I didn't know who was who. It's like ah, uh, you. It's like oh god, no, that's my girl. What have I done? And she didn't mention it, so I guess we're still cool. That's racist. Crap, you can't say that. <laughs> I mean, Ashley just unloaded into Liara. It was really messed up, and we all shamed her royally afterwards. <sighs> um, I, I'm curious if there's any, like, big Benezia fans online. Uh, she must have some sort of fan base, right? She just feels like such a zero, and she's just got novelty cleavage for an assault. Yeah, she's like, she's such, just so like a loud. weird character. It's loud. <laughs> You know. Loud cleaving. It is. <laughs> um, let's yeah. see. Oh, Jeff Enright uh, says playing on a PS3 port. Interesting. Which I forgot that came out in like 2013 or something. It's like a weird time oh. for that. Um, anyways, I finished the last half and most of combat for the Neveria main quest completely shorthanded because of some glitch. My renegade femship decided to enter the restricted area and re- triggered an adver- adversarial reaction. So I had to fight my way to Matriarch Benezia through the private security. The glitch happened as soon as I opened the locked door with two auto turrets and somehow Rex was gone. In the weapon skill radio menus, he showed up as blocked the entire rest of the mission. I did find Rex eventually, though. The lazy bastard is waiting for me back on the Normandy. Well, good. I haven't encountered too many glitches. Like, occasionally, like, I'll do, like, a dug a dug a dug a like, stuck in geometry thing for a little bit. But has anybody hit any glitches for whatever versions they're playing on? I don't think that thing, I don't think that thing's a glitch that that went on. I think that it's, like, if you enter that area with the turrets, it's like a restricted secret area. Oh, you think that's what they're talking about? Just the, yeah. okay, but, where they give you the warning mm, about it? 
But with that being said, yes, I've hit a bunch of weird glitches. I think you and I hit the same backwards, stuck backwards glitch. I hit yep. the Varen area in um, Pharos, where, uh, like where you fight the Alpha Varen or whatever. Um, my, my squad mates were stuck in the doorway and wouldn't follow me anywhere else until I reloaded. Weird. But, yeah. It's not really a bug, but all the time in combat, I'll take cover and I'll see my party member clearly wanting to take cover where I am, but it's taken. So they just stand next to me instead and refuse to go get their own piece of cover <laughs> until I leave. Uh, there's a weird moment in Novaria. Tell me if I'm reading too much into this or I've just spent my life thinking too much about video games. But there's a moment on Novaria uh, where uh, there's a line where they're like, why are the turrets facing the wrong way? Look, like, oh, they want to keep people in as much as they want to keep others out. And I was just thinking way too much about that. But like, what an interesting little tidbit. Because like, I don't know where it would come from. Does it come? It comes from some level of great interaction between an environment artist and a writer. Or do you think that's just a writer writing that weird piece of context lore of just, oh, well, let's have the turrets in this one room facing this way to help add to that. Or was somebody like, placing idea? Like where did the idea? Yeah. Originate? Or like, or is it the environment artist placing turrets and they placed it there and said, ah, maybe we can raise some lore, just a quick line of dialogue to explain it or something. It's interesting. What, what is where is the true origin point of environmental storytelling? Mm, that's what I'm wondering. Yeah. Speaking of wondering, probably any of the above. Yeah. Could have been any of the above, I guess. Right. Could be. Um, Sarah, uh, you're a delight. I know you have other stuff going on tonight. Did you have to bow yeah. out here? I think I probably should just because if if I was going to leap right into I have to have a costume and everything. It's a mess. I, I understand. <laughs> it's a lot. Okay, that's fair. Yeah. Um, although people yeah. did request in the comments um, for everybody to share their shepherd at some point. So at oh. some point before the next episode, uh, you can share your shepherd on Twitter, which your Twitter is? Oh, at Selmale. S-E-L-M-A-L-E-H. Um, and I've been, most of my Twitter today has just been promoting this thing that I have to go hop off and do, which is interactive D&D. Ooh, Yay. how does that work? Mm-hmm. Um, it, the audience votes via polls on Facebook um, for what happens. So it's kind of like an intergalactic Hunger Games where we've all been captured and we have to make it through the through the maze um, as, a, as a party. Um, but but the audience gets to weigh in and enjoy the schadenfreude of us <laughs> failing and, <laughs> and fighting things. That sounds amazing. It should be very fun. Uh, speaking of aliens, I play like a space pirate squid boy Scottish jerk and he's fun i love him very that much. sounds perfect so people can follow you on twitter and find the link for all that fun stuff i know all about that if that made any sense to you sweet <laughs> yeah uh, mm-hmm. leo and ben i need to also help out so i can watch that interactive D D thing <laughs> okay sounds, yeah that that's totally understandable fun. yeah oh, no. <laughs> no, no, no okay no. well sarah thanks for being here um we typically clap for out me. for having people transition out so you need to do one clap as your big grand exit but thank you we'll talk okay. to you next week eh can't wait. I'm so stoked. This is this is and continues to be so much fun to apply this level of like attention and thought and and to have this fun conversation about this game that means so much to me. So thank you for having me back. That's very sweet. All right. Clap out, Sarah. Bye. <laughs> Sarah clapped into Leo. Hey, Owen McCarter wrote in. You know Owen, y'all? He's oh, Owen. Owen Carter. <laughs> uh, why does the galaxy map not tag the side mission, asked Owen. Pretty annoying having to leave the map, look at my side mission journal and remember Horsehead Argo something, and then search for said system and cluster, and on top of that, click on each planet and stare at the A button prompt to see if it says land or survey. Fun process, says Owen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, it's weird doing that stuff and thinking about, like, you know, somebody probably loves this. They love having to explore and feeling like they're really charting the galaxy and figuring out you know yeah surveying each planet and everything but yeah the navigation stuff like that is just ridiculous to me it's so hard to find where i'm going sometimes yeah yeah and then to have to back to be like you have to go into the quest text for it to be like go to this system in the argos row cluster Mm -hmm. and then you have to be like like you have to back out to read the text and then enter the galaxy map and then go to the cluster and then by that point you're like wait a minute what system was it was it the this system or that one? And then you have to go to both of them and see which one has the planets you can land on and the whole thing. And then have you guys have you guys run into this the the stupid asteroids that are unknown that you need to scan in the rocky belts in no. the systems too? Yeah. It's just another dumb layer of exploration that you do <laughs> in the galaxy map. But just to be like just to be clear though, Joe, the, this game is the best, right? <laughs> I mean, like, like I said, my my run through of it this time, or maybe I didn't go into this whole thing, but like, I, 
it, it, it's definitely just feeling a little bit more aged to me. Yeah. You know, and that, that of like all, I still appreciate it on like the nostalgic level, but like, like I know I was saying earlier, there, there are just things that I don't know why Bioware didn't fix that I don't think are huge, you know, rewriting combat or enemy encounters or anything yeah. like that. But yeah, I mean, like, let me open my journal from the galaxy map. Right. Let, like, and they already, it's so like they doubled the amount of inventory space that you can have from like 150 to 300. But even 300 is like, like, I still hate managing all this crap I'm picking up. Yeah. And like, why, why aren't there better solutions to that? Oh, don't my worry. My oh, okay. deepest dive a navigation nitpick is that you, when you hover over a quest icon on the map, triangle pops up, open journal, and you press it, and it just takes you to the top main mission in your journal, not the relevant mission. Right. That's one yeah. of those things that's like, what were they thinking not fixing that? And the sprinting thing, I'm sorry to go back to the sprinting yeah, thing, it's, but it's, it's like, who... I don't trust anything else you've done if you've put this in the game. Five seconds of sprinting. But they also let you do five seconds of sprinting in the Mako. Like, the boost also has, like, that quick timer, which, like, it's a shorter cooldown on that sucker. But, yeah, it is just absurd. Um, let's see. Oh, also on the Galaxy Map stuff, Isaac wrote in asking, is anybody else, do they miss the little dumb ship icon? Or is it just me? I forgot about it. So, Mass Effect 1, the original, there's, like, a little icon of the ship actually flying around and they removed it for legendary am i remembering that correctly joe no uh i think that this i think this person is conf or is, is conflating future mass effect games wait so in a future one they have the little ship flying around in the in a future one there oh, there's a ship there's okay. a ship flying around and that you're i think even the fuel of your ship becomes relevant yes okay you're right i was i was really connecting those as well you're right uh, but I don't think that's in. I don't think that was originally in this one. There we go. Uh, okay, that's probably what he meant. I would think I was injecting that incorrect layer. Uh, the tune writes in. We got the tune uh, saying, "I don't think I even need to mention one thing because it's playing in our head right now, and that is the map music. Very excellent." <laughs> Which um, oh, the way you set that up, I was sure you were going to hit play on YouTube or something, and like we start hearing the music, but no, nope. no, just nope. we only hit play it. in our minds. That's yeah, right. I don't yeah. need to do it. Um, yeah, and like I, there's a good interview with Jack Wall that Austin Winery, friend of the show, uh, guest on Crossfade or music podcast. Please subscribe on your favorite podcast app to hear Austin Winery, famed composer, talk about Cat Stevens and music in general. Anyways, he also talks about what his beefs are with the Final Fantasy VII remake soundtrack, but. Um, he has an interview uh, with Jack Wall in the Game Maker's Toolkit podcast where they talk a lot about composing Mass Effect. And I didn't realize the extent that like that relationship really fell apart and Jack Wall and Bioware really went south. And he makes it seem like, ah, it's kind of ego on both sides. And I definitely have a lot of regrets about that era, but it's really sad. Um, but in that, he talks about how that map music was some of the earliest music ever written for Mass Effect. Like before they even knew anything about the game. That was like the demo application for another composer applying to work on a sci-fi game. So they just made this awesome piece of music. And they're like, well, there's no context for this. What can we do with it? And it's like, well, throw it on a menu or the ultimate menu, the galaxy map. And it's just the perfect spot for it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Austin S writes in probably about something you were hinting at Joe, but we don't need to go into it more. Austin says, I enjoyed a very short side mission called dead scientists in the Newton system. In this mission, you find a scientist working for an organization called Cerberus. They are basically doing evil experiments on soldiers. Specifically, there is one soldier who has come back for revenge on the scientist. As a renegade option, you have the option to kill the scientist yourself. I expected a less compassionate response from my renegade friendship, but was pleasantly surprised to hear that the, reason, that the reasoning for wanting to shoot the scientist yourself was so the soldier doesn't get marked as a criminal. As a specter, where you will not be charged with any criminal activity compared to the soldier. Yeah, I, I was I hit that moment and did the renegade option also and and was pleasantly surprised by that because you always assume it's just like, I don't have time for this pop, pop, pop. And instead, it's yeah, that sort of so that kind of it, it. It's kind of weird, though, because there's there's a dissonance because there are moments like that where it's like, oh, wow, they really put some good thought into justifying these 
these apparently renegade or evil actions. Mm. But then there are other times when it is just totally like, what, wh- why are you being an asshole here, Shepard? Right. Know? Right. So, yeah. uh, on Cerberus, I think there's also, I forget, it's something you can unlock, I believe, but there's like a little log entry, journal entry where they mention Cerberus as a company as well. Yeah. Yeah. There, there are a few, I mean, there's more than just dead scientists. There are a few missions that involve, uh, Cerberus. There's one, like, do you guys remember, uh, Admiral Kahoku, who is in the in the Citadel Tower. This is something that he gives you a side quest. It would have been at the very beginning of this section of the game. He's like trying to find something, some research team or something that went missing. I don't remember all of it. But anyway, he's he gets wrapped up in this sort of thing too. So mm. you know, I I don't think it's I I don't think it's spoilery to say like one of the interesting things about Mass Effect 1 and some of those side quests that seem uh, kind of uh, mechanical or throwaway actually are seeding uh, pieces of the world or the lore for later stuff. Cerberus, yeah. we've not heard the end of Cerberus. And there are, right. other, there are other things going on in some other side quests that or planet descriptions or codex entries or other, things like that that still that are laying groundwork that it's really cool. After you finish mass effect three, you can go back and like, they knew even then that that was going to be important. Yeah. That's, that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Neil Smith, uh, submits a comment that I'm just fascinated by, uh, saying on Elatania, the consort's trinket unlocks a vision of Prothean studying ancient man. And Denim Harry also wrote in about it saying, I've played Mass Effect 1 maybe five times before, but I'd never found the Prothean Neanderthal ball, sorry, Neanderthal ball before. It's insane. I'm also interested to know if anyone else annihilated those ugly alien monkeys on Elatania just to ease my conscience. Did you nuke those aliens, Joe? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I okay. nuked the aliens. Yeah. <laughs> so I and that's, that, that, that's a good example of what I was just talking about, too. Like that, within the context of Mass Effect as a broader universe, that, that, Artifact on Elatania is even is even more interesting. Yeah, I need to go do that side quest. I never experienced that. That sounds cool. Um, Josh writes in saying, I really appreciate how Bioware took narrative into account when considering some of the enemy encounters. For example, the side mission called Asari Diplomacy has you go on a mission for a Asari politician to rescue her from a space pirate slave ring. When you get to the pirate base, there's a wide variety of enemies and a few humans, Turians, Solarians, and one Asari whose name reads as Asari Slaver, with no other Asari in sight. It's in this moment you realize that the politician lied to you to get you to kill her sister because she was being blackmailed and feared her for her status on the Citadel. That is cool. The little name can be a, a tip-off. Leo, you want me to keep yeah. rolling with these? Didn't we say we were doing side missions in the last part? I think we said we were doing it this one. Part three? We said we're okay. doing it this one. We okay. said so. Well, I, didn't, but... I didn't want to do any of these anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, do you want to save like character side missions for part three? We can always do that if you haven't done those yet, Leo. Sure. Yeah, I have it. Okay. Yeah, we can save those um, cool. by and large. Um, let's see. Troy Ellison has a quick one here saying, um, here's what happens in the character side missions. Now he says, one thing I liked about this section was the Citadel newscast. Anytime I returned to the Citadel, the, cel- the elevator newscast would occasionally report on my actions in the game. I did a side quest involving taking out a cult leader by a former Alliance officer, and the next time I visited, I heard a report about the aftermath of that mission. I felt it was a good world-building technique to see my actions kind of ripple back through the game like that. Yeah. I like that. I like that in the elevator chatter. I also like it in, in things like uh, the outer worlds where they have those sort of like newspaper clippings that, mm-hmm. that show those things too. Like I know it's, I know it seems like a really dumb and easy thing because it's like you as a player know what you've done. You don't need the game to tell you what you did. Right. But I think doing that still gives the players the sense of like that the world is reacting to them, that, that the world is noticing their presence. And I think that that, you know, that that's valuable, even if the information it's giving you is, is things, stuff you already know. Yeah, absolutely. Just that bit of feedback is, is crucial. Yeah. Also, I thought of outer worlds more on Novaria because that whole thing about like, Oh, research station at peak 15, something's going on. I just thought of like Monarch and it's like, Oh, it's like the radio tower on Monarch. It's so similar structurally. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, it's funny because like for as different as the tones of the games are overall like, I mean, the outer worlds clearly took inspiration from mass effect in a lot of ways, but I, I still think it's interesting how well it feels like one section might fit it. Like one, a section from one game might fit well into the other. 
you know? Yeah, they should Novari finally make the remix. Yeah. yeah. Chris Culkin submits a comment saying, message coming in, patching it through. Assuming you guys have talked about your squad, or have been talking to your squad mates from time to time, what's the deal with all of them except for Caden talking about their fathers? Rex's dad tried to kill him. Garrus' dad is disappointed he left C-Sec. Tally's dad is an admiral in the migrant fleet, so she feels extra pressure on her pilgrimage. Liara only knows that her father was an Asari that left Benezia, and Ashley's dad was Alliance military trying to redeem the Williams' legacy. Even in the subsequent games, they give more daddy issues to characters. Do you all have thoughts on why the writers chose these character beats? Anyways, I should go, says Chris. They give the moms big, loud cleavage. That's, that's true something. that's true but i guess i don't know is it just a uh, character backstory what's backstory number one let's work through some daddy issues with all these characters <laughs> it's it's an easy one yeah, yeah i guess th- this had never this had never occurred to me before but i don't know i like it i guess it's one thing <laughs> There's part of me that wants to write it off and just say like, well, yeah, you talk to a character for long enough and you might learn something about their family. Yeah. But at the same time, you have such, I feel like you have such limited dialogue options with these characters that it, it I guess it is weird that, um, that, that comes up so frequently in the limited time that you have. Meanwhile, how much have you talked to Leo about his daddy issues? That's true. I don't know anything about Leo's dad. That's right. You don't. <laughs> so quit <laughs> never asked me. <laughs> Leo, how's your dad doing these days? You don't care. <laughs> <laughs> um, I like the the Liara discussions about, uh, you know, when she basically just breaks in like, oh, okay, here's how a sorry procreate if you really want the details. But I think it's such an interesting idea about like they can procreate with another Asari, but like, once we got off the planet, Asari realized that like genetically it's so much more superior to interact with other races because you gain bits of their knowledge. And so like if you do it the old fashioned way, it's kind of just like incest now to like yeah. combine and fuse with another Asari. Ew. I, I love the way that Li- Liara explains like, oh, I'm a pure blood, but no one, no Asari would say that to my face. Whereas normally like, like. That's a term in like the Harry Potter world or something, right? Like that. Yeah. Like that's a term. If you're pure blooded, normally that's like a point of pride for someone. And I like the fact that being pure blooded in the Sari culture is an insult. Right. Right. Um, I also like there's a line where Liar is talking to you, and of course she's obsessed with the fact that you've touched the Prothean beacon and all that stuff. And one of the options is you can just scream, "Don't try to study me!" <laughs> like you're scared of her, like <laughs> taking a scalpel to you immediately or something. Uh, yeah. let's see. Um, oh, Will Dane writes in with something that, God, I didn't know or I completely forgot about. You tell me, Will. Uh, they say, if you choose the spacer background, Commander Shepard's mother is also an Alliance Navy captain. You can call her from the communications room, but the first thing she says is, I'm kind of busy right now. Is this important? And it's absolutely heartbreaking. This one line of dialogue instantly defines Shepard's relationship with her mother. I, That's super cool. I've never done that. That is so wild. And I mean, I don't remember Shepard's parents ever being a thing moving on. So Shepard doesn't have daddy issues or mommy issues because she's so abandoned by them. It's not even a factor. <laughs> uh, let's see. Uncharted. <laughs> That's the definition of not having issues. Yep. Clean slate. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Has anybody ever? Yeah, I, oh, I didn't choose. I didn't choose that background for this playthrough, but I do remember that. I do remember that parent thing being a boy. Oh, that may even come back in later games. Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Uh, the Uncharted Wolf. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm a colonist through and through. So I wish I could experience that. But I. I love my colony background. Uh, the Earthborn, Uncharted Wolf, baby. Ew, you're Earthborn? Blah. Yeah, I used to roll with the 10th Street Reds, man. Oh, yuck, bad boy. There's a, uh, dun- well, I mean, you, you, there's a, depending on your background, you get like a specific, certain quests are available to you, like, each background has a quest that is available to you, exclusively to that back, to that background. Ah, I see. So like, if you're Earthborn, the idea is that like, you grew up in a rough neighborhood on Earth. And, like, join the military when you could. But what that means is that you used to roll with a gang called... I think it, I think they're called the 10th Street Reds. <laughs> and some guy from your day in the Reds uh, asks you to do a little favor for the gang. 
cool, man. That was my <laughs> dumb quest. Yep. And what is the favor? Uh, let's see. Oh, he wants, he wants you to get one of the 10th street reds out of, uh, out of jail or like basically wants you to like petition for leniency or something like that. And it turns mm-hmm. out this guy is just like, like a total terrorist <laughs> and like a racist terrorist. Keep going. Like he, like, like it's like, ah, yes, this guy wants to kill aliens specifically. And so as, so as Shepard, I was like, no, I'm, I'm not doing that. And then the guy was, you know, basically like, I knew you didn't have it in you, Shepard. That's true. And Apparently you, he didn't have it in you. I mean, Mr. Renegade over here is going back on every good Renegade option available to him. Well, no, except this is like, it's, it's a Renegade option to flip on this guy. You know, like, uh, I see. Like, it's not, it's not a paragon thing necessarily. It, there's still sort of a renegade way of telling the reds to go stuff it. So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It was fun. Hey, the uncharted wolf, Leo, do you know what they did? They supported us yeah. on Patreon at like the $2 tier, any tier whatsoever that maybe even the tier, the $5 tier where they unlock the podcast version of this entire discussion, but they, they wrote in on Patreon there and they said, okay. Hey, cohorts join the Patreon. Oh, I was setting this up just to be obnoxious, but I know they actually talked about it in this comment. Um, I joined the Patreon just so I could talk about this masterpiece (laughs) of a game and my first playthrough of it. I actually wanted to talk about Rex and how I was completely wrong about him. When I first met him, I expected him to be the RPG trope of big, strong guy-like shooting. Instead, I found him to be one of the most compelling party members to speak to. I was so captivated whenever this big brute talked about the negative impact the genophage had on his species and his dream of one day reuniting the clans, the way he talked about his father as well, where even though he hates him, you could feel the almost betrayed tone in his voice. Garrison Talley is still my ride or dies, but I'm glad to have found a strong and dependable ally in old Rex. Yeah, I, it's such a good, fun structure for him telling his backstory about just rival clans, dealing with frustrations on his home planet, and then it's like, yeah, Jared, oh yeah, he was my father. I should, probably should have mentioned that a while ago. Like, oh my god. Oh my god, Rex. Talk about daddy issues. Yeah. Leo, are you taking, like, are you taking the time to like walk around the ship and check in with your party members regularly? I completely forgot that's a thing I should be doing. So I'm excited <laughs> to be, do it now. <laughs> oh wow! You should you should absolutely be doing that. That is that is the heart of Mass Effect in a lot of ways. There, um, there's that's, a that's part of that's part of what's frustrating about it too, though, is that like this is back in the age of Bioware games where they kind of had weird gates on it, where it's like you can't just stop. And like, all right, Rex, you and I are going to talk for 10 minutes and go through all of your dialogue options. It's like, yeah. you'll have one conversation and then you might have to go do something and then you come back and then you can have another one. And it's like, but it's things, it's that kind of frustrating thing where you can talk to a character again and again and again, and they won't say anything new until you finish the next story mission or something. And right. then it's like, finally you go and you can check on them. But that also creates a weird, like, mechanical loop of all right well i just finished Navaria. time for me to go talk to caden talk to liara liara go down the elevator talk to tally talk yep. to garris talk, you know and so, so leo like, has just like missed all that stuff or will it trigger after like a side quest or something i think he should be able to do i mean like if he's progressed this far he should probably still be able to do it i think i guess i, I don't know for sure Okay. I'll report back. Please yeah. do. Um, Shameless Twitch says, I spent an embarrassing amount of time, by which I mean more than zero one night, seeing if I could get the Mako to land upside down and stay that way. The closest I got was about a 10 second long upside down skid down a mountain and across a flat basin before the little guy flipped itself right up again. Also, all I can think of when driving the Mako around a new planet is that it's basically just a 3D version of Moon Patrol, that arcade game from the 80s. It's very hmm. Moon Patrol inspired. Which is Andrew? Of, oh, Andrew Anner's favorite uh, arcade game of all time is Moon Patrol. He said, "Really, number one." He favorite says. Ar- arcade game, not arcade. game of all time. I mean, okay. maybe he'll stretch it. Yeah, no, but arcade game. <laughs> <laughs> like one one thing that, about that kind of exploration stuff that I find funny is that I guess will this is more of a Mass Effect Two comment, but like I I think it's interesting when you look at that. It's like what is what is fun or compelling about that kind of exploration in Mass Effect One? to me is the stuff we were talking about before, right? Or like, like that sense of finding, finding a beautiful place and sort of beholding the universe or whatever. The fun part of that is not 
mining minerals and doing mini games to get Turian insignias and stuff, right? Right. And yet, in the transition when they go to Mass Effect 2, that whole concept of like planetary exploration has been distilled solely down to like collect minerals, strip That's mine the, the galaxy. That's them. the whole thing. Yeah. 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 Um, Patrick, how he, I think, speaks for everybody when they chant, bring back the Mako. <laughs> Whatever you're doing, Bioware, bring it back. Put it in Dragon Age 4, you cowards. Uh, Catherine Gilbert says, as a casual player that is not so good at shooter games, I love the mini map with the red dots showing me where I'm in danger. Makes the game much more playable for me. Yeah, and helps you hunt down the, the straggling you know, mercenary that's stuck in cover behind a <laughs> yes. crate and won't move. <laughs> yes, exactly. What's yeah. going to trigger this cutscene? Yeah. And you know, something else about like, I'm reminded in, in those situations where you see a lot of red dots swimming around you. One, another good change in the legendary edition is that they've really cut down on the number of barks that characters have. I actually mm. wish Sarah were here. We can ask her about this one in the next, in the next episode. Cause it's like, Enemies had a very had very few lines that they could do, so they just did them all the time. Like, like you'd go into a room full of enemies and you'd hear, I will destroy you. I will destroy you. Enemies everywhere. Yeah. I will destroy you. Calibrating, like, yeah, I, right? I, I, like I the Garrus thing. Yeah. Yeah. But they've it seems like I've rarely heard those barks ever in encounters in the legendary edition. Now. That is true. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh Andrew George. Asked, am I the only one jumping over my coffee table to grab the remote for the mute button on the mass relay load screens? It feels like they're trying to blow out my eardrums. <laughs> they get super loud. I also, hit, going back to the question about getting weird bugs before. Yeah. So, as I was doing the infinite money exploit, traveling back and forth between the med clinic and the markets, mm -hmm. um... There was a weird point where I'm, I'm making that trip frequently. So you go to the fast travel station, you go, you go to one place, do your thing, go back and run. I kept hitting this thing where it's like the volume of the fast travel station would keep escalating. So it was like a little, like when you do it normally, you just hear a little nondescript like ping. Hmm. But then like as, as I would continue making these trips in succession, it would feel like it got louder and louder to the point that it became like, like I had to mute my TV because it was hugely inordinately loud when I would just like access the fast travel station. And it's just this like ear splitting ping would come through my speakers oh my when God. I did it. That's absurd. So, yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Mass relays. Everything's louder in space. I think space kind of acts as like a magnifier for sound as far. I'm no scientist, but I believe that's the breakdown. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. John G writes in and says, I love the detail that whenever Shepard leaves the Normandy, there's a voice message stating Presley is in command. There's a small detail that makes the world feel more lived in. Yeah, I like that too. It's really smart. Really However, smart. However, <laughs> a couple of bones to pick with Presley. <laughs> I like that. But why does, why does Presley, like, why can the computer say Presley, but not Shepard? Why is it like, like, why does Presley get a name? But Shepard's just commanding officer is ashore. Oh. Exo Presley has the deck. Exo Presley stands relieved. I mean, who's... But you're just if, commanding officer. If you had to program in the names, though, one has a much higher likelihood of dying <laughs> at any moment, and that's the person <laughs> flinging themselves around the galaxy fighting aliens. So, you know, it's a safer move just to be like generic commander. Yeah, yeah. Exo Presley's not going anywhere. Oh, no, he's, he's living for He's there years. for keeps. Yeah, he's yeah. living in a sorry <laughs> life over there. <laughs> just a thousand years on that ship. <laughs> Uh, Andrew Burns writes in and says, anytime I play Mass Effect 1, there's something very specific I look forward to. The creepy Metroid-like ambient music that plays when entering a building on one of the Uncharted worlds. It's only about a minute long, but to me it perfectly accents the game's brilliant atmosphere, lens flares and all. I can dig it. I think the only music in this game that I don't like is the music that plays on Pharos, which is... It's just like this sad somber flute that I just associate with like running back and forth in those hallways getting lost. But... Uh, I don't know, like, I don't have any specific, like, apart from the galaxy map and that title screen, I don't I guess, like, a lot of the music doesn't stand out to me. I, I don't what? Know, like, I, don't, <laughs> I, don't, I, I have a terrible ear for this. I don't know. Leo, do you, like, what? what uh, no, don't try and shift this off to Leo. This is a Joe Shame Corner. What are you talking about? 
I like the Citadel music isn't great. Like the music when you become a, a spectacle. <laughs> What's the crux of the entire game? What's it called? Spectacle. Spectre. Yeah. <laughs> that doesn't stand out to you. Oh, I mean, a lot of it does, but I mean, like, I, I don't like, I guess what I'd say, like the set piece musical moments I like, but I don't like, I, I couldn't hum it or identify any of that sort of like ambient music. The Citadel? Stuff. I guess I could identify that one just because I spent so much time there. Yeah, I think you're not giving enough credit to just the music in these places. Okay, all right. Okay. You should like it more. Yeah, no, why aren't guess, you giddy? <laughs> I want to. I want to know from from Leo, who's playing for the first time. Like, how much are you noticing? How much does the musical landscape stand out to you? Occasionally, I go, "Oh, this is good," but I couldn't hum anything. I couldn't hum the main menu theme or. Whatever. I think with more time, obviously, I could. But at this point, I appreciate it. But yeah, it hasn't like I haven't gone out of my way to listen to it. I mean, we can give you the time now, Leo, if you want to just try and remember how it goes. <laughs> Jack Wall at his finest. Uh, Yara writes and it says, last time you guys talked about cool spinoffs in the Mass Effect games. <laughs> and after reading some of the codex entries on the Solarian special task group, they would make a cool Splinter Cell, Splinter Cell style stealth game. They discuss carrying out missions on shoestring resources. So having that element of trying to get by with little and infiltrating rogue operations could make for an interesting game. That's true. The Solarian Special Task Group. That would be a sweet. That would be a sweet direction. Just we're only focusing on a Solarian Special Task thing. But I think that's the type of like deep dive that Mass Effect fans would be on board for. Like, yeah, that's so specific. I'm on. I'm great. interested. Well, and I like the idea of those groups existing in the world. They do tap into it a little bit in Mass Effect 3's multiplayer. Oh, which yeah. Is not in, it's not in the Legendary Edition, but the I think the idea is, is that, like, if you have a Solarian character, that they are essentially, like, a member of the STG, or that uh, if you're an Asari, you are, like, one of the Asari commandos that, you know, like, Benezia had or something like that. Yeah. Do you think... Um do you think a line that they should have added for Liara when she takes out the last enemy is she should say, a sorry, not sorry? Yes, I do believe that. Thank you. I believe that pretty deep in my heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, Joe, you know what I found this weekend in a weird coincidence? Is, um, that- I went out to like a, our lake place, which... Yeah, Leo's been to. It's just a garage with an arcade unit in it, basically, on a lake. <laughs> <laughs> but um, we have, like, a DVD player out there, so something I'm very into now is, like, finding very cheap DVDs and just watching old movies there and stuff. Like, all right, we got yeah. Good and the Bad and the Ugly. That's just going to run on loop <laughs> in the background of this lake place. Um, and so I went out of my way to go to a dollar store and rummage through their DVD collection, and I found a DVD that was... $15 at a dollar store, a DVD, and it was... This one's got to be good. It was the Mass Effect Paragon Lost animated film, which I had completely huh. forgot even existed. Did you ever watch that, wow. Joe? Oh, boy. You know, I think I did. I, w- I could not have even told you that existed until you <laughs> told me, until you said Paragon Lost, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. Like, I think it's like Vega's backstory from three or something, but I, I it's just Oh man. You know, the, the thing that's so sad about that is that like all of those all of those like game adjacent movies that come out suck so bad that even if you watch them, they're hardly like like they, they just go go in one one side of your head and out the other. They are so insubstantial. I don't know. Yeah, and I always just think of like, you know, with like the directed DVD Disney films and stuff. Um, yeah. I, I'm always just amazed about like, yeah, I understand animation budget's going to be cheaper, but like, why does the script have to suck? <laughs> does it, is it that much more expensive to write a good script compared to a bad script? Is it all just come down to time? And it's like, we have no iteration time possible. Your first draft is doable. Let's start animating Vega right now. Yeah, I don't know. I kind of want to look this up now. Did you did you buy it or or no? I would have if it was anything less than fifteen dollars. <laughs> That's outrageous. <laughs> what have I made of money? Um, speaking okay, of here, which, I want to look it up. Yeah, Paragon please do. Loss. See what it said on Rotten Tomatoes. In the meanwhile, uh, I was just reminded they did announce a Mass Effect movie. Uh, according to uh, Wikipedia, here talk of a Mass Effect film in Hollywood began in two thousand seven, 
Oh, we got producer Avi Arad optioned the rights in 2008. That's the Spider-Man producer. Um, and then they announced in 2010 that they were doing it. And it was reported that Mark, who wrote I Am Legend and Thor, was writing the screenplay. And so they had a big announcement. And then, of course, it just, like all movie adaptations of games, just slowly disappears. In August 2013, it was announced that Legendary Pictures would present the film to Universal Studios in the upcoming months, having distanced itself from the connection to Warner Brothers. It is up to Universal where the movie will happen. It ain't happening, folks. No. Joe, what'd you find? Uh, I found that I, even after reading the Wikipedia description, I am not sure that I have seen this movie <laughs> or not. <laughs> I think I'd like to watch it. Maybe I can find it for cheaper online. I'm sure it's just on YouTube or something. Um, anyways, uh, Steve Bellagarde writes in and says, For me, leaving the Citadel is where the true Mass Effect experience begins. Going from location to location, dealing with characters and stories that are specific to that location, while all feeding into the main narrative, it takes on more of an episodic structure that really helps the pacing for me. Yeah, Leo, I think this section of the Deepest Dive is the most Mass Effect 2 of, <laughs> of the three Deepest Dive chunks, where it does feel episodic, like mini-adventure, mini-adventure, mini-adventure. So do you, do you like that episodic structure versus a more focused thing, Leo? I like that structure for sure. I mean, what I liked so much about Pharos is it just felt like a Star Trek episode that yep. you were in the middle of, like as that the layers of intrigue began to get revealed. I'm all on board for that. And again, yeah, that was the disappointing part about the other side stuff is it was like kind of episodic, but they they weren't very meaty, you know, right. Weren't really doing unique things. It didn't feel like. Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the side episodes kind of feel like a little more like storyboards for Star Trek episodes rather than actual Star Trek <laughs> episodes. Right, right. You know, for sure. Playing with your toys on the same Star Trek little set. Little yeah. Play set. Or, you know, it's like, or, or it's just the things like, you don't see the action, right? It's like, uh, here's a dead body. Something happened here rather than seeing it happen. You know, it's like, like, obviously they, I understand that there's budget for how much of game you can put in your game, but of course, um, it, it does feel like some, maybe some interesting, some interesting stories ended up being, uh, not, not being fully served because they were kind of uh pushed aside or or minimized in that like side content way rather than you know being fleshed out more yeah but other beats we didn't hit for this section for anybody boy boy i feel like i feel like we've been pretty thorough i'd argue it's a pretty deep dive yeah there's one other note <laughs> that stood out to me is like throughout a lot of this section even the first section i had a lot of moments of how different really are these dialogue options and like right at the end of this section for the main path, I feel like I really hit it where a <laughs> uh, big old uh, Joker goes, what's our next move, Commander? Head for the Moo Relay? And your dialogue options are not so fast, no, and there's no point. <laughs> it's like, and th it has to be the same dialogue for each of those options, right? Like, what are, what are you even doing here? Did you test the theory? No, I should have saved scummed it. You're totally right just to jump back through all that stuff. But all right, so... That's it for this section of the deepest dive on Mass Effect. Uh, you can join us for the grand finale. Uh, that is going to be next week. So on Monday, June 7th, uh, we have a comment up on Patreon at patreon.com slash minmax with two N's where you can submit a comment. So if you're watching this, thank you. If you've enjoyed it, you can help support it by jumping over to Patreon and submitting a comment for us to read about the ending of Mass Effect or anything else that we've missed. Correct something that we got horrifically wrong along the way um, and submit it over on Patreon and we'll read it for the grand finale where we're covering Vermeer and everything else in the game. All other side quests, all DLC, all that fun stuff. I think uh, just as a quick side note too, I think we had some really good comments in this in this one. I think that there's yeah. a lot of really, really insightful stuff going on there. I'm glad that people are so like engaged and interested in, in leaving such, I don't know, like, specific feedback on it you know specific is always the key yes just really focus in like we're all, we can only get to so many mako comments you know and so try and find a unique angle for something that you're passionate about and we'd be delighted to read it on the show for the grand finale of the deepest dive all right uh joe where can folks find you if they want to learn more about you and learn about your daddy issues yeah man i'm on uh <laughs> yuck i'm on uh twitter <laughs> at joe juba all one word. You know, spelled go. like it sounds. It's just very intuitive. Yeah, that's good. Leo, people were upset that I didn't ask you 
for a plug at the end of the first discussion for the deepest dive. So please, Aww. what would you like to plug, Leon? Oh, check out my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Leo Vader. If you've liked my E3 stuff in the past, it's like that, but about other topics besides video games. How's Leo, everything? If you could, oh, yeah. if you could point someone towards one video on your channel, what one should they check out? Hmm. That now you see me video. I am really happy with not just because it got big, but I, watching that again, I, I'm really satisfied with that. I think it's got a great pace. Yeah. I love that one also. Do you feel a pull because your most successful content is about like TV and entertainment, which it felt like wasn't really a central idea for like the, the YouTube channel, but do you feel compelled now to like, oh, maybe I should steer it more in that direction because people are much more interested in clicking on that type of stuff? Um, I think it, it'll be, you know, every other or every third, I feel like can be about that. And it's like super fun to do. And certainly I spend as much or more time watching tv and movies than i do playing games you know it's like a big part of my life so i think i would have a lot to say about it so yeah I mean, yeah i'm excited to get into that more nice uh watching us live by the way at the backstage pass ten dollar tier on patreon zach e says i love your ketchup video leo thank you that's my new one ketchup good or bad i answer it for good there it is check it out over at youtube.com slash leo vader all right thanks to everybody for uh, submitting a comment. We really appreciate it. Thanks for being great sports, for listening along, playing along, following along. Um, a lot of people are doing their best to have that first episode of The Deepest Dive hit a million views, so we end up doing Deepest Dive <laughs> for the entire trilogy, but I don't think it'll happen, but we'll try and find something. I don't know if it's going to be like a max spoilers if Leo finishes two and three, or we'll try and find some way to satisfy it if Leo in particular feels compelled and has the time to continue, because I think it's going to be really interesting to see. Or even honestly, Leo, I don't want to force her hand while we're live while we're alive but um but like if you just like stream like the opening of mass effect 2 i would love to see that like that that is a really compelling That'd be idea fun. Yeah. that's all i've heard is like i i will at least want to dip my toes in mass effect 2 no matter what and yeah everyone says the opening is phenomenal yeah it's, it's really very cool. cool all right thanks so much for watching and listening everybody we'll see you next week for the grand finale of the deepest dive be good have fun let's go you can help support independent games media by subscribing to Minmax on YouTube here, or you can support us over on Patreon to unlock exclusive shows like Minmax Council. You can call into our podcast. You can put a picture of your choice on every Minmax video, or you could have us plug your passion project on the Minmax Show podcast. Minmax is a Patreon about games, friends, and getting better, and we exist because of you. Any help telling a friend's appreciated.